Welcome to home of lights out extreme fighting. It's time to see what you got in this cage. We are at the beautiful Palma Valley in Southern California at the Casino Palma. And you can bet your life that you're going to have a ton of fun and see lights being turned out tonight on Fubo TV. Casino Palma is ready. The crowd is packing in and the lights are on and the show is about to get underway. We are live. Hello and welcome to Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10 alongside my tag team partner known for dropping warheads on people's foreheads and WA superstar Blake Bulletproof Troop. I am Pablo Alcina and this is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10 and Sean Merriman, he's building a monster, Blake, and talk to us about this great event. What are we going to see? So if you've ever tuned into Lights Out Extreme Fighting before, you know that we bring the best fighters from around the world to get inside this cage and get the down. So one thing you can expect to see on tonight's broadcast is someone's going lights out. We have seven fights today and actually coming in five different weight classes. Let's look at some of the names on here. And there's a couple of fights that we're going to break down in the co-main event and in the main event. But six total fights, Blake. And what I love about this fight card, we see some flyweights. We see a couple of bantamweights. And we also see heavyweights and the co-main event, which I'm really looking forward to. Me too. We have Chuck Campbell in our co-main event, riding a three-fight win streak, including one incredible knockout. I'm looking forward to watching him get inside and try and climb the tall task he has in front of him in his opponent, Jared Vandera. So let's break down the two fights. Let's begin with the co-main event. Chuck Campbell taking on Jared Vandera. Now, I love this fight, Blake, because we see experience in the mountain, Vandera. But Chuck Campbell, ooh, he comes in with power. So let me see you break down the knowledge of Chuck Campbell in this fight. So like I mentioned, Chuck is riding a three-fight win streak, including one incredible highlight knockout on national TV. Extreme athleticism and a desire to get in here and put the fight away. But he's taking on Jared Vandera. They call him the mountain, and they call him that for a reason. Now, we've seen this guy fight in the UFC. Six fights inside the UFC. Recently fought against Arle Orlovsky. So, Jared Vandera, he brings experience. He's not going to be nervous, but also it tells you about lights out. These are guys that fought for the UFC, are now wanting to get inside our cage. Talk to me about the mountain. So the Mountain is an incredible athlete, and like you said, experienced as it gets, took Andre Arlovsky, former UFC champion, to a decision. This should be an absolute war. Now, it's scheduled for three rounds, five-minute rounds, but I don't know if we're going to get out of the first round, so you have to stay tuned, stay watching Fubo Sports. Also, in a few minutes, we're going to bring the one and only Sean Merriman here, of course, a San Diego Charger. He was a god in this area, so lots of Sean Merriman jerseys out here. Sean Merriman will be coming up, and he's here also to see the main event, 125 pounds, flyweights. But these guys are so fast. Efrain Escudero, who's calling the fights in Spanish, he, he fought in the same card with Anthony Antidote Doe. And he says, Pablo, he's crazy. I mean, he's just all intensity, full go, 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 go. Anthony, the Antidote Doe, looking for his seventh win. I like what I see, but it's not going to be easy against Rojas. It's Rojas. not going to be easy against Rojas, who's also riding a three-fight win streak. Another thing worth mentioning, Rojas' last three fights have been canceled, and that tells you he is one scary dude. So you don't want to blink in our main event tonight at Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Yeah, they call him, uh, Anthony, the antidote. Well, the antidote for boredom is call your friends, tell them, put on Fubo Sports, put on Fubo TV, and watch Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Because look how beautiful the sun's coming down, Blake. It's outdoors. The weather is perfect. You were a pro MMA fighter, still are. You I haven't officially retired. Did you ever fight outdoors? You know, I have never fought outdoors. And particularly being here in Southern California in the desert, it's going to be somewhat different. It's a hot environment. So it's a little different than being in an arena. But it still brings that big fight feeling here at Lights Out Extreme Fighting. Yeah, Efrain Escudero is calling the fights in Spanish. I asked him, have you fought outdoors? He says, I did. Altitude affects you more than fighting outdoors unless there's humidity. It's kind of hot. I'm kind of sweating, which is not normal for Southern California. I do 
feel some of the humidity. Some of these guys are 260 pounds, Blake. It's going to be interesting, but it, the breeze is coming in. I, I like I like this energy for fight night. One thing worth mentioning about sweating is the more sweat we have, the less friction you're going to have between you and your opponent, which may drastically change some of the grappling exchanges we see tonight on Lights Out Extreme Fighting. So I'm going to throw this out here because the fans are already texting. When are we going to see Blake Bulletproof Troop fighting inside the cage? Is it possible, Blake? Because the people want to see. They want to see those guns, Blake. You know, I keep these hand grenades <laughs> locked, cocked, and ready to rock. So you can never rule it out because your boy Bulletproof Troop just might have another fight or two left in the tank. I will be calling it because this face is too pretty to get punched. But I will be in your corner. I want to see that. But you guys want to see this. Let's go to Sean Merriman, the founder, the main man, the boss of Lights Out with the one and only Bonnie. Let's go to Sean and Bonnie. Sean Merriman here with me, the founder and CEO of Lights Out. Now, Sean, Lights Out was something as the LA Chargers. You were the man, you were Lights Out, and now look at to see this in fruition at number 10. Yeah, this is exciting, man. Um, you know, this is the first time that we got a chance to come back to San Diego, my own stumping ground. Uh, I've been working on this for over a year, and um, you know, I'm excited because we have a lot of the military, the troops out here from Camp Pendleton, Miramar, Coronado. Um, and I felt it was important when we come back here, come back to my home, that we get the community involved, and you see all the people out here, man, we're just getting started. Speaking of the community, you, you dropped by Camp Pendleton to make sure that you have the Marines here in attendance. I, I did, I did. And I haven't been back to Camp Pendleton since we used to host our training camp. Uh, there on the base, man. So when I came back up, all the guys said, man, wh where you been? Where you been? So I I'm really excited, man. The, the, the fans, the people come here. I've seen a bunch of Chargers jerseys here. So uh, I'm just ready to see these guys scrap. You know, I'm, I'm back there doing the way in. The energy in there was crazy. Uh, I thought I was going to break up a couple fights myself, man. So I told them, just hold off and let's let's go in here and get busy. Now, being a football player, sometimes you can use that discipline as being a fighter. And in the first fight, we have Jacine, who actually played at USF, you know, University of Air Force. And he was actually a football player safety. How do you translate that into being a fighter? You know, for one, um, you know, being a former player, you know, I just, I care a lot about these fighters. Um, yeah, I've been training with a lot of these guys for 17 years, uh, these coaches, and some of the best MMA fighters in the world. So these guys now are coaches. So they know I care about the fighters and want to take care of these guys, make sure they have you know, the best care we can give, make sure they, if anybody's injured, hurt, uh, make sure all the fighters are taken care of. And obviously, safety, uh, fighter safety is, is huge. One thing I noticed, you know, for the weigh-ins yesterday, you were speaking to the amateurs, and you really are supportive. You're not just the face. You actually are ground, like, on the ground, like, helping these guys out. Yeah, I, we, we love having the amateurs fight for us for a couple reasons. One, very seldom does amateurs get an opportunity to be seen. Two, we hoping that these guys, when they're ready to turn pro with us, we want them to be able to grow with us and say, you know what, those guys that lights out extreme fighting gave us a shot. We want to turn pro with them. And obviously with all these people here, the fans, you know, being on football, getting the eyeballs that we need, these amateurs are really getting into it, man. So we're hoping they stay home with us and then turn pro with us as well. Lights out extreme fighting. Now we know your social media presence, you know, and that's where I think everyone's hard to see this. And then it grew into fruition. Talk about the social media. And now here you are with Octagon. You, you know, it's, it's key. Um, you know, having that following because I played on the, the biggest platform in this country and that's in the NFL uh, so having being fortunate to be there and kind of transition these eyeballs that I did on the football field to the MMA to this cage these people here big shout out to, to Casino Palma for having us here it's outside it's our first time being outside we had some cool drones I don't know if you got a chance to see the drones they were flying over a minute ago so the fans and the people watching will be in for a treat and speaking of support, you've got some great sponsors. Talk about some of the sponsors you have here. Yeah, we got uh, Family First Life, obviously, my guys at Maverick Gaming, uh, Ghost Energy. I took, I drank about three Ghosts. I know you love Ghosts. Yeah, yeah. So if you see me running around, I've got, I had three Ghost Energies. Um, and, and obviously, Casino Palma for, for allowing us to have come here and have these awesome fights. And continue to support. you got a lot of the Charger players that may be in attendance. We may see some some stars in here. Yeah, we got we got Quentin Jammer that just showed up. Donnie Edwards is coming. Gilbert Arenas will be here. Uh, soon, I, we got to get him here because I'm trying to get more NBA guys to fight. Uh, so I, I, we got to get Gilbert uh, to give his reasons why he won't go and pro help me promote fights. Um, so you know, uh, Corey Legion, who's, who's on his way right now. So we just we just excited. You know, a lot of the uh, charges and NFL, the legacy guys. We made a huge partnership. So we're having more of those NFL legacy guys to come here. So it's it's, it's going to be a good. One. And the last thing, and you know, you wake up at four in the morning. When are we going to see you in the octagon? Maybe you, you call out one NFL player. Yeah, you know, look, I, I'm not opposed to it. Um, you know, obviously, as you see this setup, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. You see it yourself and the wins and everything else. But, you know, anybody wanted, they can come get it. Bobby Lashley, if you're listening, 
Come take the fight. Stop talking. Let's do it here in Lights Out Extreme. Fight no wherever. It doesn't matter. But, you know, I'm about promoting these fighters, getting behind these other guys and, and supporting them because, you know, being able to use my platform to get these other up-and-coming guys seen is, is most important to me. Thank you, Sean. Congratulations on your success. Appreciate it. Back to you guys. Thank you, Bonnie. Sean Merriman building a monster here. Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10 gets underway in a few seconds. So call your friends on Put on Fubo Sports. Lights Out Extreme Fighting. Blake, Bulletproof Truth, Pablo Alcina. The show is coming up. Are you pumped, Blake? Are you pumped? I am pumped. The energy in this place is electric, and I am ready to watch somebody go, who lights out? Beautiful moon, fly me to the moon. And put on football sports, lights out, extreme fighting 10 is next. How do you not love technology? Look at that gorgeous drone shot flying over the Palma Valley at Casino Palma. What a beautiful scene. Look at the mountains. The weather could not be any better. This is just pristine, gorgeous night to watch some MMA. Yeah, out here in these rolling hills, ready to see the sun start going down, the moon start coming up, and the lights start going out. And what I like seeing is seeing the fighters over there. They're all getting ready because I went in the back, you know, to freshen up. And then you're seeing the guys. So I was talking to a couple of them. One of them, I'm going to mention it during his fight, but he's fighting for his first time ever. So imagine the nerves of your pro debut. So let's take you there, Blake. When you made your pro debut, and we're going to see a couple of people having their pro debuts tonight. What are they thinking in there now before their first ever pro fight? You know, a Lights Out Extreme Fighting is an incredible place to make your pro debut because you're fighting on one of the biggest stages you could be fighting on. There are a lot of different promotions out there, and none of them have the level of uh, production, sophistication, and other talent inside of the locker room like Lights Out Extreme Fighting has. So it adds another level of pressure to these fighters. Yeah. They're excited to get in there, but there's definitely a level of anxiety. And excited, but nervous there's a massive crowd's gonna be here you have television cameras and production it's yeah it's and usually usually when they make their pro debut it's kind of in a smaller company less fighters these guys a couple of them making their pro debut and right next to them is a guy like Vandera who's fought at UFC who's fought at Bellator and to the other side you have guys that have fought all over the place so it's a different level here lights out and that's what I love that Sean Merriman lights out is building they're building something from the ground up but it's already in perfect place. And I can't believe it, Blake. Already lights out, extreme fighting 10, and then pretty soon 11, and pretty soon 100, baby. We're going nowhere. 
So another thing to add about these fighters being able to debut here is you're brushing shoulders with guys, like you said, Jared Bandera fought in the UFC. And I think everything is contagious. You fight around guys that are high level, and when they make it to that UFC level, because lights out extreme fighters always make it up to that level, then you're a little bit more prepared for that next stage of, of pressure. Yeah, and also what I like about Lights Out, you also see some fighters that are maybe in the twilight of their career, but they won that glory again. And that's what I think we're gonna see in that co-main event. Jared, the Mount Vendera, he doesn't wanna come to Palma Valley and lose. He wants to come in here and go out on fire. He wants to knock somebody out. He wants to put on a show on Lights Out. So I love that. We have the new ones and we have the veterans that are looking for that final huge fight. And both guys, are the newer guys are looking to put on a show and the veterans are looking to put on a show. And that's what brings such amazing fights here to Lights Out Extreme Fighting. And something else Sean mentioned earlier, we saw a little bit of tension during weigh-ins between Woo! some guys. And that always adds another level of intensity when these two guys get in and start throwing hands. Well, because it's, it's a professional sport and there's respect. But at the end of the day, it's still a street fight in there, especially inside that cage. But we're going to also see jujitsu. We're going to see some wrestling. We're going to see some boxing. We're going to see kickboxing. We have a fighter today who's a pro boxer, pro kickboxer, and now he's fighting in MMA also. So that's what I love about Lights Out. We yep, see all the I'm different ready. styles. And we also see the flyweights, the main event. Doe taking on Rosas, 125 pounds. But for more, let's go back to Bonnie. Sean wasn't kidding. We were going to have some stars in the building. Quentin Jammer, defensive back for the L.A. Chargers. I want to say San Diego Chargers. Because I, I, I play for the San Diego Chargers. Exactly. Char Char so you're here, Quentin, supporting your boy, Sean Merriman. You know, what does it mean to see his dream come into fruition? I'm so proud of him, man. Like, he, he, he's he been doing this since, you know, since I've known him. You know, just getting out and, like, He's been fighting and practicing fighting, and I got into it um, um, at the end of my career also and got into jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai, and so, like, now I'm just here, like, support my boy. Why is it that a lot of football players, and I guess athletes as well, want to be able to get into the octagon? Why is it kind of a switch that people, right if they retire, they want to start fighting? Because you want to continue to compete, and... We always, like, as football players, we always feel like we're more athletic than everybody else. And I know, you know, at, like, being athletic doesn't matter in a fight, but if you can learn to fight as an athlete, you can, you can grow and you can be better than everybody else. You Maybe you two get in the octagon. No, 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 no. Okay, no. <laughs> now I do have a real question while we're on camera. <laughs> Look, he, he trains. I've been trying to get him to fight for three years. I've been hunting him down because you know he he does he trains. So I am 44 <laughs> years old with a bad back. <laughs> with a bad back. If I get in the ring, like I um I I have competed in jujitsu and and done a few um, jujitsu tournaments. I've done a lot of jujitsu tournaments, but um, I compete in the Masters, which is like the old man li league of jujitsu. <laughs> You're still in shape. I'm, I'm still in shape. I'm still trying to get there, you know. What do you expect from tonight's fights? Anything exciting? Are you looking at the card? You know what? Like, I'm just looking forward to a fight. I, like, I love the fight. I absolutely love the fight. So I don't care how the fights go. I'm just absolutely, like, in love with the fact that we have fights in San Diego right now. We were speaking about that, that you were happy that there's finally a fight here in San Diego instead of having going to L.A. or so forth. So how nice is it to that they're going to continue to do some fights out here? It, it, it's awesome because, like, when you have kids, the trek to L.A. is a lot, you know, when you have kids. But um, here in San Diego, like, I can get here and enjoy my night. And I, I'm looking forward to just enjoying my night and enjoying some fights. Now, the Chargers are now the L.A. Chargers. Do you keep up with the team at all? You know, I do. But I have to say um, that I'm a Seattle Seahawks fan now because I have a younger brother that plays free safety for. That's right. Yeah. So now, you're, now you're a Seahawks. You're 12th man. Yeah, <laughs> Seahawks fan now. Thank you so much, Quentin. Enjoy the fights. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you, Bonnie Jill Laughlin. She's awesome. Great that she's part of the broadcast for this show. Blake Bulletproof Troop. 
former NFL player. He's saying, oh, he's too old. He's 44. He looked in amazing shape. I think he could get in there and do some real damage. I'd love to see Sean Merriman. And Sean Merriman, you called him out. I'm calling you out. I want to see you in the cage. It'd be awesome. But for all of you that are waiting for the fight to start, there was a holdup. Uh, the medical personnel wasn't here yet. So, of course, with no medical personnel, we couldn't get the fights underway. It wasn't a Fubo sports delay. It wasn't a lights out delay. It was the medical personnel. But the good news is, Blake, they are here. So the fights are going to get underway. Tell the people one more time why they have to watch Lights Out. Lights Out Extreme Fighting, bringing the best fighters from around the world to get inside this Lights Out Extreme Fighting and turn somebody's lights out. We did Lights Out Extreme Fighting 9, and we saw one big heavyweight after he won. He did a little dance. He broke it down. We had another one rapping. We had another one singing. So I love the personalities. We have bios and videos. You're going to love the fighters, the people that are going to get inside the cage, the people the Lights Out Extreme Fighting brings together. Blake and Pablo return. Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10 gets underway next. Palma Valley, we are at Casino Palma, lights out Extreme Fighting 10, we are seconds away to getting this party underway, the main event, flyweights at 125 pounds, the co-mate, light heavyweights 205 pounds, and we have everything in between, this is going to be a beautiful show with lots of knockouts, some submissions, but I'm leaning more towards the knockouts, not that many decisions, but we just want to get this show underway. Everything's almost in place. The medical personnel is here. Almost getting this show ready, so tell your friends to put on Fubo. Blake. Yeah, so like I said, we had a little bit of tension at the weigh-ins, and one fun thing about tension is sometimes you watch guys come in here and compete in mixed martial arts. Other times you watch them come in and fight each other. So I'm expecting to see some fighting here at Lights Out Extreme Fighting tonight. I just want to see fighting soon. We're almost underway. Broadcast is going to be around two hours long, so make sure you get your drinks, you get your food, and you enjoy this Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Lights Out Extreme Fighting 11 might be coming up as early as October, so make sure to follow us on, on I don't even know if it's called Twitter anymore, but follow us on social media, at Pablo Alcina. If you're watching, follow me, I'll follow you back. Blake, what's yours? At Big Troop 22. And so one thing at Gilbert Arena, or, um, sorry, um, Jammer mentioned earlier, considering getting inside here, he said he's old, but he's athletic. And athletes will definitely do better in combat sports. At the end of the day, strategy wins wins fighting. It's a strategic game, but having the athleticism behind the strategy is a winning formula. And I would love to watch an NFL caliber athlete get inside of this cage, whether it's Sean Merriman, whether it's uh, Jammer, or whoever watching a guy of that caliber come in here and compete in mixed martial arts. But there's no helmets inside the cage. 
It is just out for the world to see and to get punched. It takes a different kind of animal. I mean, I love NFL players, but when you get inside the cage, when you get knocked out, when your face is on the line, it's a whole different adrenaline. What do you think? I agree 100%. This is a conversation I had with Sean yesterday about Bobby Lashley, who we heard him call out earlier on the broadcast. Bobby Lashley is an incredible collegiate-style wrestler, but grapplers are not great at getting punched in the face. Football players, on the other hand, they may have a helmet, but they're used to the contact and collisions. So it's a really interesting thing to wonder if Sean Merriman steps inside that Lights Out Extreme fighting cage against Bobby Lashley. Is the wrestler going to be able to take the striking? Is the wrestler going to be able to take the football player down? Questions that can only get answered inside the Lights Out Extreme fighting cage. Take my money. I would be there in the front row watching that fight. That would be an amazing one. And also, let's let's talk a little bit about Sean Merriman. I'm going to tip of the cap because it's not easy to be a pro player and then be a fighter. It's even harder to be a pro player and then be a businessman. And he's got all kinds of businesses, insurance businesses, Lights Out, his t-shirt line. I love what he's building here, and he's thinking of the athletes, for the athletes, and I think that's why fighters want to come to Lights Out, and they want to keep fighting for Lights Out. That's why you possibly want to make a return fight and fight in Lights Out. 100%. Sean has said fantastic things, not just for the sports that he's been involved in, but for the athletes involved in those sports. He's trying to bring as many people as he can up to the top with him, and that is an incredible thing to say about Sean Merriman. Yeah, and especially for the young fighters, they want the, the fight, but they also want the limelight. But you know what we all want? We want action, baby. Blake, Bulletproof Troop. I am Pablo Alcina. Let's get Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10 underway. Let's go to our cage announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Welcome to Casino Palma. I'm your host, the Iron Man, Tyson Johnson, and this is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. This is being presented to you by Family First Life. And brought to you live on Fubo Sports. Tonight's promoter is Sean Lights Out Merriman. Your matchmaker is Heather Soto. This event is sanctioned by the California State Athletics Commission. Commissioner Peter Villegas. Executive Officer Andy Foster. Ladies and gentlemen, your timekeeper for this evening, Jill Trigg. Your physicians at ringside, Dr. Michael Ricciardi and Dr. Paul Wallace. Judging tonight's event will be Herb Dean, Frank Trigg, Raphael Davis, Jason Herzog, and Felicia O. Your referees for this evening, Herb Dean, Jason Herzog, and Frank Trigg. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great night of fights coming your way. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready to put some lights out? First, fighting out of the blue corner, please welcome Kevin Chosoy. There's Kevin. Undefeated. This is an amateur fight. Undefeated as an amateur. Won by knockout, but it was back in October 22. I, I'd ask you how confident he looks, but I can't see from the mask, Blake. Well, what, what do you think about the look walking in? I like it. I'm feeling it. The first thing I'll say is I am a fan of fighters trying to increase the entertainment value around their performances. Given the first most three important things to being able to fight are being able to fight, being able to fight, being able to fight. But beyond that, being able to market yourself and stand out outside of the cage. And we see Kosei making an effort to do that. Let's see what he can do inside of this cage. Like you said, coming off of a knockout win. So this kid's put some thought and preparation into tonight's performance inside and outside the cage. He's from La La Land, fighting out of Los Angeles. Kevin Kose. This is an amateur fight. Taking the mask off. He's got There's the vibe, he's got the confidence. Lots of sweating here outdoors though. The man in the monster unmasking himself and ready to get in and unleash the monster inside of this cage. And like you said, sweating. It's something I mentioned in our introduction that this heat and fighting outdoors is likely going to be a lot more precipitation and sweat coming off of these guys, which may impact some of the grappling exchanges that we see during tonight's bouts. This just a second amateur fight. Now, of course, when do they go pro? How many amateur fights do you want? With boxing, uh, you usually see double-digit 
amateur fights. Sometimes as many as 20, 40, 50 amateur fights. MMA, you don't want to take that kind of beating, but are you a fan of lots of amateur fights or go pro as soon as you can? I think it is a very individual basis, person. I think that it is wise to take amateur fights. Speaking from my own personal experience, I had zero amateur fights before going pro. And as a result, I feel like I took losses on my record and learned lessons that I could have and should have learned during my amateur career. And as a result, I had to fight myself out of a hole later in my career. So Coach Bulletproof Troop would tell you, get those amateur fights in. And that's what we're doing here in Lights Out. We have two amateur fights. But what an awesome experience for him. His second amateur fight. And it's in the Lights Out cage. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner, Jason Olabrice. Bryce making his amateur debut. This his first amateur fight, and look at the scenery. How can he not be pumped? Oh, and I like. The, oh yeah, little shadow boxing. He's got the smile. He's rolling the shoulders. How do you see him coming out looking loose, looking fairly comfortable for his first walk down to the cage? Something else worth noting. We just saw him do a little bit of shadow boxing. Clearly. Everything on this kid's mind has to do with inside of the cage. We saw his opponent, Jose, come out in a little bit of a costume. Maybe he's thinking too much about the outside of the cage stuff right before stepping into the cage because the only thing you want to be thinking about inside of that cage is fighting. And JC looks like he is thinking about fighting right now. Yeah, JC, what I like, he was trying to hold the smile, and then you'd see the smile. He'd hold the smile and see the smile. He is enjoying this moment. I feel, there he is again. Like, he feels confident. He doesn't want to smile, but it comes out. You see that, Blake, also, bro. 100%. And one thing I do like about that is you can tell the kid is enjoying the moment, which I think is a big part of feeling comfortable inside of that cage. A lot of people have this big moment, and the pressure's on. And instead of smiling and enjoying the moment and being excited to perform, they're worried about performing. And Jason looks like he's ready to get in there and get to work, and he looks extremely happy about it. Blake, explain this to the viewers, you being a pro MMA fighter. We see this is an amateur fight, but you're gonna see uh, shin guards. Some amateur fights have more guards, some of them have less. Explain the reason and why and how they decide that. So like we mentioned earlier about having fights, you're adding a handful of mileage to your body. But first, to tell the tape, a 4-H, Four-year age difference, Kevin Quos, the more veteran at 28, both 6'1", both 185, and this is the pro. They, a very similar, almost all the way across the board. One thing, a noticeable difference, the 1-0 record. Let's go to the ring announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, this amateur bout is three two-minute rounds in the middleweight division. Introduce me first. Fighting out of the blue corner. This fighter stands six feet, one inch tall. He weighed in at 185 pounds. He's an independent fighter with a mixed martial arts record of one win and zero defeats. He hails from Agora Hills, California. Please welcome Kevin Chose. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner stands six feet, one inch tall. He weighed in at 185 pounds. He's an independent fighter making his fight debut. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome out of Naples, Florida, Jason Ollie Bryce. One thing to notice here, Kose has not broken eye contact with Ollie Bright thus far. This is an amateur fight. Are you guys ready at home? This is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Alongside Blake Bulletproof Troop, I am Pablo Alcina. And let's get this fight underway. So like Ola Bryce say, with, with the black. Oh, nice quick combination by Quose. Oh, Quose, great pressure, but a takedown by Albright. Oh, maybe not. Oh, Albright. Oh, nice defending and the right hook by Old Bryce that connects. And another right. Oh, they're both swinging, punching. Quose responding. What a fight. Yeah, or, these boys came out throwing, ready to get in and get to the action. This is the first amateur fight by Jesse Old Bryce, and he came out enjoying it. He still looks confident. Connects with the left, looking for the takedown. Let's see if he gets it this time. Loses him, but Kose goes to his back. Albright lets him up, which I'm surprised about. After two takedown attempts, let his opponent up fairly easy. Ooh, right hand. Get back. Get back. 
Oh, and left that connects again. I am liking how both of these boys are keeping their hands up and throwing bombs back and forth within inside of the pocket. You typically don't see that at this level of amateur competition. Oh, a little spin kick by Old Bryce. Oh, and again with the left, the left is making damage. That one connects. Yeah, they have been exchanging rear hands, and there has been some damage thus far. I think the best strikes of the fight have been rear hands by both fighters. Again, the right connected, top of the temple by Justine Albright. Not a lot of power, but he's still he's adding points. And he's mixing it up. He's throwing hands and then looking for his takedowns. He needs a little bit more technique behind his takedown if he wants to finish it. But I think he's doing a fantastic job of mixing up his offense. But good defending right there from that guillotine. Attempt by Kevin Quose, who's making his amateur debut as well. One thing worth noting, Albright has been switching stances. He's back to, to the regular orthodox stance. Now he's in southpaw again. Being able to change stances like this opens up your rear strike, which is typically your power side, to a variety of different attacks. Oof. Right, doesn't miss by much. Again, these are 185 pounds. These are big boys. They have power. But just the first ever amateur fight by Jesse. Oh, oh, and that one connected with the left, and a big takedown, and Quose might have just stole the round on that. What a finish to the round by Kevin Quose, who did enough. I thought Jacine Ole Bryce had the round easily won, but that was a big blow, and that was a clear knockdown. So I 100% agree with you. I was just about to say, man, I'm glad we're talking about these fights and not uh, judging them, because this was a very back-and-forth round. We saw right hands landing by Kose several times, and then takedown attempts by Albright, just like that, during some of these these exchanges. It was very back and forth. But I agree with you that at the very end, another takedown attempt by Albright, who almost got him down here and then let his opponent back up, which surprised me. And now here's probably the last one, where we saw Albright get dropped. And I believe that Kose won the round as a result of, oh, it wasn't a knockdown, but still he got top position. I believe that won him the round, just barely. Yeah, and also the judges always fill it in at the end of the round. I thought Olive Bryce had done enough. He might have gotten knocked on himself. Close, close, leading to Quose. But I liked how Olive Bryce was the more aggressive one for most of the round. Woo, these amateur fights are fun. Yeah, very great aggression for a first-time fighter. Fighting on a stage with the magnitude of lights out extreme fighting. Olive Bryce out of the red corner. Oh, went to the body for the first time, nearly connected. I was head say, movement. Great adjustment on that body shot. You know his corner probably said, go oh, low. It's good. Oh, these boys are just banging. Now, Jose is leaving his head open. If Jesse would just wait, he'll be able to connect. And right there, the opening. And now Jacin shaking his head going, yep, yep, I see it. I Pablo, see it. you called that. He was getting his hands were coming down. And then right then, Albright came over the top with a nice right hand that looked like it spun him around a little bit. Another kick by Ola Bryce. Ooh, up top. Oh. Kevin Quose is leaving his arms a little bit too low. Is he not respecting the power of Jacine or is he getting tired? I think a little bit of both, but Jacine's going, don't make that mistake again. Boom, and there it is. I would also attribute some of that to experience, and it just hasn't been drilled in enough to be a habit to keep his hands that high. Something else worth noting about amateur fights, there's no elbows or knees allowed to the head of an opponent. Oh, going for the rear naked choke. Let's see if he can get these hooks in. You see Ola Bryce trying to peel that hook off. Oh, he's he got it exposed. In. Oh. Flattened out on his stomach is a terrible place to be. Jose's oh. going to need to get a better grip of his he hands. He lost his mouth guard. Still 40 seconds to go. Just seen. Well, if he can get his hands in a better position here, like a gable grip, he may be able to finish his choke, but you see Ola Bryce fighting those hands down, preventing two hands from getting enough choking power to get a submission. And good use of his chin also as a defensive mechanism by Jessine Ola Bryce. Oh, for his, oh that one's in. Tap, 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 and it's over. Kevin Quose rolled him over. And there we saw, what a fight. And I love how Jacine, he's still smiling, he's still laughing, he goes, okay, I learned a lot. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna register this. I had the fight and I let it slip away. Now for the other side, Kevin Quosa goes, I took some blows, but I recovered and I saw what I had to do to win the fight. This is why you were right, Blake. Amateur fights, all the difference. Now Jacine learns from this instead of having an L in his pro record. I 100% agree that there are some lessons that he'll learn here that'll make him better in the future that are not going to impact his career in the long term. One thing worth noting about Kose, when he saw his opportunity to try and get the neck, he stuck on it and ended up getting the finish. Here's some of our highlights from round two. So right here, Justine was looking to 
clinch, and there's that perfect hook. I that thought was it was the, gonna. That was the right hand you called. Yeah, but I mean, it just bounced off. And then here, talk us through the whole progression. So we saw Albright give up his back for just a second, and that's all that it took for Jose to jump on top. Started to fight his hooks, and you can see his left hook now inside. Took him a minute, flattened out um, Albright here and eventually was able to work his hands into a position to generate enough force to get the tap from this, this back mount. Yeah, what I like about it, watch it again when he flips him over, how his hooks kind of flatten him out, and there's nothing that Jacine could have done. See if we see it one more time. Now, help, so help, slid, help Jacine He slid out. in the right hand here. Right there, he hooks. It was almost knee. too late by that point. It was yeah. fantastic by Kose. As they slipped over, he slipped that right hand under his neck and was able to bring his left hand over to get the gable grip, which allowed him to secure the choke finish. Great fight, man. For an amateur fight, that had it all from the start. It had Jacine smiling. It had energy. We saw grappling. We saw good defending of, of the wrestling. All we didn't see, we didn't see any Muay Thai, but we saw almost everything else. We saw some kickboxing, a little boxing, and finish it off with a little jiu-jitsu. You know, we saw a combination of competing in mixed martial arts and fighting. There were times where they were competing and technically grappling, or technically fighting, and then there were times where they were just scrapping. Let's go back to our cage announcer with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, one minute, 37 seconds into round number two, your winner, by way of tap out, Kevin Jose! Victory by Kevin Quose. Quick break, and we'll be back with more. Kevin Quose picks up his second win as an amateur. He's undefeated as an amateur, and what a good fight to get lights out. Extreme Fighting 10 underway. Some of the highlights, and we'll be back with more. You're watching Fubo from Casino Palma. This is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Sunset has arrived at Palma Valley. This is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Let's go with Bonnie Jill Laughlin and our winner from Fight One. Uh, Kevin Jose with the submission. You just told me that you had four days notice. How are you feeling right now? Tired. Very tired. What did you do to prep? You know, you only had four days. What were you doing to Nothing. try to prepare for this? Nothing, because if I prepped, I would have been sore. Now, this is your second amateur fight. You know, what is next for you? What was that? This is your second amateur fight. Now you're 2-0. Oh. What what's next for you? Yeah, it's just, just another day, I guess. I don't know. Now, did you have any problems? Because you were switching stances a lot, you know, from Southpaw. Anything that you had to adjust? No. No. And were, when, in that chokehold, did you think he was going to come out of that? Or did you think he was going to tap out? Uh, at first, no. Then he started to get out of it. And I didn't think I was going to get the finish, but I did. 
congratulations. Hope to see you again. Back to you guys. I like what he said. He said he got a four-day notice, so he couldn't really train for it because he'd be too sore. Maybe the viewers at home aren't understanding. Explain a little bit of that, Blake. So a lot of times you have a six or more week preparation period of time to prepare for it, not only for the fight itself, but for a specific opponent. Maybe I'm going against a wrestler or a striker to create a game plan to beat this particular, to solve this particular puzzle. He had none of that. He had four days, which meant you kind of got to just jump in there and you better have been ready already. And he, he, he and he was ready, but I want to give credit to Jessine. Ollie Bryce, his first fight, he looked really good too. I mean, we saw talent there. Normally with pro amateurs, you, you kind of see like dirty fighting. I saw solid technique by both of them. I agree with you 100%. We saw a ton of technique and skill out of both fighters. And one thing about getting inside the cage is it only takes a small mistake and you could end up losing. We saw Ola Bryce turn his back for the slightest second and Kose jumped on and was able to eventually take that mistake and turn it into a submission finish in round number two. And that's what I love about MMA because with boxing, there's one style. Well, with MMA, you can see it all. Let's go back to our cage announcer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Michael Burke to the cage. Michael Burke entering first undefeated as an amateur. This is our second amateur fight of the night. After this, all the fights are pro. Now, this is Michael Burke. I saw him when I went backstage to get a bottle of water before, and I told him, are you ready? He said, I'm a 1,000% ready. I am pumped. And then I asked him, it's just your, your third amateur fight. How much longer do you want to do amateur? Do you have a plan in place? And he said, I'll go pro when I'm ready to go pro. And I thought that was a perfect, intelligent answer. I agree 100% because you're not 100% sure when you are ready to go pro. There's a lot of lessons to be learned. The best thing you can do is have an educated coach who has your best career in mind. And by coming out here and learning these lessons at an amateur level, he's doing the right thing. And thus far, he's been doing the right thing inside of the cage, too, because he's 2-0, and undefeated, stepping in here tonight for his third fight. I asked him, what are, what are your personal interests? What do you like? He says, I love hunting. And I think in this beautiful Palma Valley, I'm sure there's some, some quality hiking around. There might be some quality hunting, but he wants to go head hunting inside this cage and pick up his third win as an amateur. Amateur pro, you don't want to have a uh, loss. You, you like being undefeated. He's undefeated as an amateur. Yeah, and like you said, likes to hunt, and he will definitely be hunting inside this cage here at Casino Palma. One thing worth mentioning, 2-0, undefeated, which makes me wonder, has he been put in a position yet that really tests his heart and his drive? Or has he gone in and just steamrolled opponents? Because it, we don't know everything about a fighter until he's been in a really bad spot. I'd rather be undefeated than have losses. But it's one of the things to question when we have not seen a guy take a loss thus far in their career. His trainer, Steve Swanson, and here's Michael Burke coming in super smooth like blowing no extra energy there's some that come in all rush he comes in came in slow and now he's moving around i like it confidence in that young man let's go back to our cage announcer tyson johnson ladies and gentlemen please welcome nathan morris to the cage coming in second out of the red corner Nathan Morris. Once again, this is an amateur fight in case you're asking about the shin guards. Sometimes you see the shin guards covering the feet. Sometimes they're just shin guards. With Michael Burke, you see the shin guard covering all the way down to the feet. It was different in our first fight. A little bit different there. How do you see the entrance of Nathan Morris? He's one and two as an amateur. A little bit different with the two losses as uh, Michael Burke. He looks excited for the moment, but I do see him breathing a little bit heavier. Not that that means he's nervous per se, but you can tell he knows that this is a major platform to be performing on. And he does not look quite as cool, calm, and collect as his opponent does. I mean, we are at a Casino Palma, so you're telling me if you were to place a bet, no, 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 we don't bet. We don't bet, but this fight is gonna be fun. You can bet on that. It's going to be Michael Burke taking on Nathan Morris. His trainer for Nathan is himself. 
Whereas with Michael Burke, he's trained by Steve Swanson. What do you think of a fighter who trains himself? Is he just not finding the right person? Do you still want to? I think that is a very difficult position to be in because if you're training yourself, then likely your training partners is not a very deep pool, which makes me concerned that he may not be challenged enough in training, A, and that B does not have a structured system in place to figure out where his deficits are and how he needs to get better. So I definitely don't, don't recommend not having a coach. Let's go back to our cage announcer. First, let's look at the tail of the tape. 20 years old for Michael Burke, 31 for Nathan Morris. Kind of strange seeing an amateur fight at that age, but everybody lives a different journey in this world, Blake. I agree it's never too late to start the journey, but that is a drastic difference in ages, which translates to a, in my opinion, drastic difference in ability to absorb damage and athleticism. Let's go now to Tyson Johnson, our cage announcer. Ladies and gentlemen, this next amateur bout will be three three-minute rounds in the bantamweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This fighter stands five feet, 11 inches tall. He weighed at 135 pounds. He represents Swanson Striking System and Team Hurricane. He has an undefeated record of two wins and zero defeats. He hails from Coachella Valley, California. Please welcome Michael Burke. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner stands five feet, nine inches tall. He weighed in at 135 pounds. He represents North County MMA with a mixed martial arts record of one win and two defeats. He hails from Escondido, California. Please welcome Nathan Morris. Taking on Morris. Fans of Escondido, California behind us chanting for Nathan Morris. Our second amateur fight. After this, it's all pro fights. And the fight is on the way. Michael Burke, the 20 year old, out of the blue corner. Nathan Morris, 31 year old, out of the red corner. Lots of smiles for Nathan early on. Burke looks like he's trying to step back a little bit and keep range. Makes me wonder if he's going to use those long legs to land kicks against his opponent, Nathan Morris. Morris was the first one launching a kick. There another one. Left and low, but no power. Burke measuring him out. You can see how fluid and relaxed Burke is. Makes me wonder if this fight goes longer, what energy levels might be like in the third round. There are only two minute rounds. This being an amateur fight, three rounds, just two minute round, or oh, three minute rounds for this one. Another chopping leg kick of course. He has thrown several very powerful leg kicks that have landed flush thus far. Yeah, those shin guards don't completely help you from the pain of those kicks. Yeah, I would think that the shin guards are actually a little bit more protection for the shin than they are for the opponent. Yes, there's a little bit of protection and help in absorbing damage, but not necessarily a ton. Morris dropping his hands, kind of teasing Burke to throw. Yeah, both guys' hands are actually relatively low. Now that they're inside the pocket, they're a little bit higher. Double underhooks now by Morris. I like the, the feint with the left and then the lead right by Burke, but he didn't have enough conviction with it. He kind of pulled up instead of just letting it fly. I agree. We see great head position now out of Morris. Ooh. He's trying to lower his arms down towards the lower lower torso of his opponent, Michael Burke. Yeah, Morris looking for the takedown. Good defending by Burke. The closer Morris is able to get to the hips, the more control of Michael Burke's hips he gets, the easier the takedown will be. You can see Michael Burke fighting those hands out so, you, so that uh, Morris no longer has double underhooks. Who's burning more energy, though, in this position? I would say Morris is, but I think that it's a wise time to be spending energy, looking for the takedown and being in a controlling position. And also looking to steal that first round, and the first round's over. I'm going to have to lean towards Morris just because he did a little bit more. And he had those leg kicks, in my opinion. The biggest moments were those leg kicks and then that fence work. Not a whole lot happened in the first round. Both guys feeling each other out. I expect to see Michael Burke start throwing some big head kicks later, later on in this round. Reliving the highlights, it was Burke early, but again, it kind of slow with letting it fly, and he missed there. And then the nice knees by... 
Mertz. Did, did not set up that right hand, and as a result, Morris was able to get double underhooks and control his opponent for about 20 to 30 seconds on the cage, which might not sound like a long time, but it's 25% of the match. And as we saw the very closing there, we saw Burke throw a head kick that Morris just leaned back for, dropped his hands. And if I were Burke's coaches, I would tell him to come in and start looking to throw something big from my rear leg towards my opponent's head. Yeah, you definitely don't want to go into round three needing a knockout. So I think Burke needs to know that he lost round one. You can't keep measuring him out for too long. You did it for the first three minutes, and it cost you the first round. I agree 100% with you all. Let's go to round two. Round two underway. Show a class, clashing hands early. But I want to see some fists flying. Burke teasing again, but not letting it fly. And again. You can see Burke already tried to went up to check the kick once or twice when Morris fainted it. Because he's definitely thinking about those low kicks. One thing is when you get a guy thinking low and then you come high, you might be able to find an opening upstairs while they're thinking low. Yeah, just two minute rounds. He's fly by these amateur fights. Burke, let it fly already. I agree with you. Burke needs to start letting his hands and feet go. He's doing a good job of trying to find angles and control Ooh. range, but thus far he's thrown one punch, and we're about a quarter of the way through this first round, or second round. And again, Morris's kicks are not clean, but they're still getting points. They're still connecting, and Burke is, keeps waiting. It's almost as if, like in, in sparring, he would see the punch and he'd throw it, and since it's not there, he's not throwing it. <laughs> the guy's not going to just leave his face there for you, Michael. Right, and gun shy is the term that I would use for that. He definitely, there we, there we go. go. Sometimes you just need to get hit to let your hands fly a little bit. I'd like to see him continue with the output. And I like the combination, but his last two punches were going backwards. He had Morris leaning backwards for the first time. He should have kept going forward, but again, that's what these amateur fights are for. I agree. We just saw Burke throw another head kick that did not miss by a ton of space. I would like to see him throw some straight punches to get more stepping or leaning back and then follow that with a big lead or rear head kick. There again, I think the head kick is Burke's weapon right now, especially at this range. Put his hands in his opponent's face and then throw something upstairs with some intensity. Last 15 seconds, who's going to steal the round? Ooh, another chopping leg kick by Morris. Burke tries to throw one back, but definitely didn't have the power of Morris's. Now to Burke's credit, he looks to be getting bigger as this fight goes on, and now he's connecting. And just like I said, who's going to do enough to steal the round? I'm going to give that round to Michael Burke for that little flurry in the middle. Huge. I agree 100% that that was that the very end of that second round gave Michael Burke the round. Again, a very close round, but he's going to need to apply that same output we saw in the last 20 seconds seconds to the entire two minutes of this third round if he wants to go home and keep that undefeated record. Let's go to highlights from round two. A little bit better from Michael Burke, but it was early Morris with the kicks. Yeah, we see more, uh, Burke staying just beyond range, and here was one of the best moments of the fight for or, of the entire fight and the round for Burke, where he got hit and then threw his hands back and let some stuff go. Right here. Ooh, and that one he barely missed, but there he connects with a nice two. I think it was enough to steal the round. I agree, and hopefully that gives him some confidence to start implementing a lot more offense in this third round. Th those moments are what we need to see more of out of Burke if he wants to finish or win this third round. And also, being your amateur fight, you want to put in quality work. Just going backwards and not throwing, yeah, you're not receiving, but you're not getting the work in that you want to use these amateur fights for. And not just that, but fighting on probably the biggest flat platform of his early career thus far. You want to come out here and make an... Ooh, Morris coming out here saying, I want to make a name for myself too at 31 years old, his third amateur fight. And Morris wants to win this. Both guys seem like they have more desire to win in this third round. Well, just two minutes to go. Morris again with the intensity on these low kicks, looking for it on the inside now, where we saw a lot of his other kicks were on the outside of the leg. It's Ooh. Burke needs to have more offense like that and continue to throw and follow up. Burke has a nice jab. He snaps it pretty well. He's just not throwing. A kick to the head. No power there. Yeah, those head kicks are what I would be telling him to throw more of. Ooh, man, shopping leg kicks again. 
That's one thing about going against a taller fighter like Morris is, is being able to chop on those long, daddy long legs. There's Burke. Yeah, Burke needs, this is what Burke needs to continue the output here. He can't disengage and then play the range game. He needs to stay inside. And he split the lip of Morris or the nose. They can't quite tell. Now left and a right to connect. And now Burke wants to throw. I like what I'm seeing. Michael Burke. Me too. Sometimes guys need to get hit once or twice before they really get in and start fighting. And Burke seems like one of those guys. Wow, we see some color yeah. on the face of Nathan Morris. I think it was that straight jab, which I was calling for. He's got a nice, he snaps it. It's a good punch, and he finally let it fly, and I think it opened up the nose. I did not see a headbutt, Blake. I don't know if you saw a headbutt. I think it was from that straight right. It's hard to tell us oh, if this takedown take could win the fight for Morris, or it could lose the fight for Burke. He needs to do everything he can to get back to his feet. He does not want to end this third round on bottom. Because you don't know if judges are going to base Oh, look at Morris. There we go. Judges, in my opinion, should base it on damage. And we see more damage on Morris's face, but we've seen. And what a finish to the fight. The takedown might have won it for Morris. But the judges also see blood and they see the damage. So now, I mean, I don't know who I'd give this fight to. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to lean Burke. I, I think it's Burke. a very tough one, and that's why I'm always glad I'm at the commentary table. One thing worth mentioning, though, is Morris has blood on his face, more visible damage, yeah. but the amount of leg kicks that he landed on his opponent. Here, let's do a cut. Let's see if it's a headbutt or if it's a straight. Boom. Was oh, it that oh, left it hook? Headbutt. Oh, yeah. The left hand busted Morris open, and as we saw, wearing a crimson mask at the end of again? the third round. I want to see it again. Are you sure? Yeah, that was a left, not a headbutt? Yeah, I think that was it right there. Then he opened it up more with the punches. But then here comes the takedown and a couple good hammer fists. I like the defending by Burke. Man, what a tough, what a tough loss to either one. Drama, baby, at Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. A quick commercial break, and we'll be back with the official decision. Lights out, Extreme Fighting 10. Former NBA superstar Gilbert Arenas and king of NBA Twitter Josiah Johnson talk to the biggest names in sports and culture on No Chill. Check them out Sunday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern on Fubo Sports and anytime on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. No Chill with Gilbert Arenas on Fubo. Back to Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. 
Now time for the official decision. What a fight. Let's go to the official decision between Nathan Morris and Michael Burke. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for both of these gladiators. And now, ladies and gentlemen, after three exciting rounds, judge number one scored the belt 29-28 for Burke. Judge number two scores the belt 29-28 for Morris. And judge number three scores the belt 29-28 for your winner by split decision, Nathan Morris. The victory to Nathan Morris, split decision, and I think we're split even on this table. I mean, I'm not going to question the judges. It was that hard of a fight to call. I would have leaned, leaned Burke, but that last second takedown, man, I give lots of points to takedowns. Sometimes they give more for boxing. They gave it to the takedown. They gave him the round. You know, it's one of the interesting things about MMA. I prefer for things to be judged upon damage, particularly visible damage. But that's not what judging rule set says. Here we have the replay, I believe, of the punch that, that opened up Morris. But so because it's effective striking, grappling, and ring control and aggression that the judging is based upon, I'm not entirely, there was that punch that opened him up. But I'm not entirely surprised that that's the way that we saw this decision go. Well, let's go back to Bonnie Jill Laughlin with the winner of this fight. Together, their country music's hottest super group. The front man, Saturday, September 16th at Casino Paul. Tickets start at just $20. Visit CasinoPaul.com for tickets and information. How did you guys hit? Was that actually a jab or was that a headbutt? Can you explain what happened there? Oh, a little skull. I don't know. Felt a little headbutt, maybe. Now, you know, your face got a little colored there, and then you were able to still do the takedown. How were you able to compose yourself and, and settle in? Uh, experience, about it. Now you said that you like to read books. Any books that you did to prepare for this, or anything that you? The Bible, the Living Book. That's about it. What's next for you? What's next for Nathan Morris? Uh, I'll see. I'll, I might hit up Sparso. I might hit up Epic. I don't know. The next lights out. Anywhere. So. And Nathan, I saw your trainer. He was giving you a lot of uh, insight. What did he tell you between the second and third round? What was that? Between the second and third round, what was your trainer telling you? Uh, they're telling me to most likely take him down. So. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Back to you guys. Thank you, Bonnie. Bonnie Joe Laughlin with the in cage interviews. And what a tough fight with Blake Bulletproof Troop. I am Pablo Alcina. We both saw the same fight and we both weren't sure how to score it. Tough pill, but that's what amateur fights are for because Burke loses this fight, but it was just an amateur fight. But it still hurts. Did you like the decision, Blake? You know, I personally, I'm a bigger fan of seeing damage with fights. We saw a lot of visible damage on Nathan Morris's face. Um, I thought that Burke had the better with some of the overall grappling and so forth. But we saw um, Nathan Morris end up walking away with the win. And that's one of the things about with judging. You can never be mad at who sees what because it is a qualitative opinion, meaning it's what do you think. There's not a scoreboard like we see in a lot of other sports. What I think also happens is, though, the judges always see the end. Even You could dominate the first minute, but in the... If, who wins the last 20 seconds because the judge thinks okay if the fight wasn't stopped if it kept going what would happen i like you know the the whistle the, the bell rang call it there and i thought burke won but i think the judges see the takedown they see the blood they see morris still attacking and it kind of leans you to go morris with that one. so i'm not hating the decision i don't think it was a wrong one i just personally think the cut the punch i thought burke had done more you agree with me, Blake? I agree. <laughs> so let's go for more Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Remember to find us on social media and always watch us on Lights Out Extreme Fighting. This is just 10, but we're coming with 11. We're coming with 12, and now we're coming with the next fight. And our cage announcer, Tyson Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the cage, Joey Beatrice. Oh, it's time for the big boys to swing them punches. Joey Beatrice. Like you said, the big boys. And one thing about guys that fight at 205 pounds and above is things don't need to be pretty to turn somebody's lights out. 
you can just barely graze the head. Maybe hit him on a weird spot of the head. And somebody can get knocked out very easily when you have the amount of weight behind the strikes that a light heavyweight or a heavyweight has. And these are heavyweights. And Beatriz is a big boy. And this is a pro fight. The amateur fights are done. The rest of the fights, all pro fights. We have an amazing co-main event and a main event. You have to stay to watch all night. But this one, watch every second of it. Because this one might last three rounds or it might last three seconds. Like I said, that's one of the things that I love about watching big boys fight. It's very rare that we see a heavyweight fight go to decision. Now this, the eighth fight for Joey, but this is his pro debut. His seven fights before this were all amateur. Four wins in the amateur circuit, but this is pro debut. The sun has set, it's now nighttime in Puama Valley, and now the lights are on you, big boy. Joey Beatriz weighing in at a cool 265 pounds, and he is ready for the moment. Back with Tyson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the cage, Elijah Harris. Fighting out of the red corner, Elijah Harris from San Diego. So you know he's got friends. And he trains at an incredible team, fighting out of 10th Planet San Diego with Manolo the Hurricane, who has coached a ton of different people in a variety of different fight organizations around the world. He has some fantastic teammates. And not only that, but one thing worth mentioning, he is a big, tough Hawaiian. I fought a Hawaiian once in my fight career, and it was one of the toughest fights I've ever been in. There is not an ounce of quit in a Hawaiian, and I expect Elijah to get in here and bring that Hawaiian fighting spirit to the Lights Out Street Fighting Cage. Hearts and thoughts and blessings to everybody in Hawaii affected by those wildfires. This man, Elijah Harris, wears that pride of that island on his chest, and you know he wants to fight here for his family, for his people, for his career. And this, a fight in his area. He's from San Diego, but you know he has that love for that island. And I'm sure emotions running high for Elijah Harris. You could see him walking, taking his time, almost a solemn vibe for standing with his people as he makes his way out here to the cage, putting his lay on his coach. That's Manolo the Hurricane right there. Incredible top-notch coach here in Southern California and throughout the world, fight career. Part of 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu in San Diego. Of course, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu all over the place. They produce so many top fighters that have fought everywhere. So it's awesome to have Elijah Harris here in the lights out cage. So something worth mentioning about Manolo the Hurricane. He cornered Ken Shamrock way back in the early UFC days. So Manolo has been around the fight game as long as the fight game has been around. So he has a ton of experience and knowledge at preparing guys to get inside this, this cage and fight. He's watched the entire evolution, and I'm sure that Elijah Harris is prepared to get in here and try and turn his opponents to life south. Now, huge difference in experience. Elijah Harris, lots of pro fights. Difference for his opponent. This is his pro debut for Joy Beatrice. What would you tell Elijah Harris facing a big heavyweight in his pro debut? But before you tell me, let's go back to our cage announcer, Tyson Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, this next bout is three five-minute rounds in the heavyweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This fighter stands five feet, 10 inches tall. He weighed in at 264 pounds. He represents strike and shoot, making his pro debut out of Temecula, California. Please welcome Joey Beatriz. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner stands six feet, two inches tall. He weighed in at 255 pounds. He represents 10th Planet out of San Diego. Ladies and gentlemen, he has a pro, debut, pro record of four wins and three defeats. He hails from San Diego, California. Please welcome Elijah Harris. 30-year-old Joy Beatrice, 42 years young for Your Elijah for Harris. Will be Three trip. inches more for Elijah. Quickly, Blake, what do you tell a pro fighter facing someone in their pro debut? You know, I would tell Elijah to be patient. We're going to find our spots and get our things in. 
Although Beatriz is not entirely new to fighting, he is fighting on the biggest stage he's ever been on, on national TV. Waiting for the cage to get locked. Third fight of the night. These guys are staring daggers at each other. Fight on the way. Ooh, Out of the blue corner, Joey Beatrice. In the red is Elijah Harris. No touch of the gloves by either fighter. Not even a desire to reach their hands out. These boys just want to put their hands in each other's face. I don't think it was out of rudeness. I think it is out of Joey was locked in. And so is Elijah. First quick kick. You see the speed on the kicks of big Elijah Harris. Again, 42 years old, but he moves like he did when he was in his 20s. Yeah, power behind that kick. We saw him then faint a kick and get a big oh! action out of his opponent. He attempted the flying knee, and there was Joey to catch him in the air. Elijah's doing the right thing by trying to dig his left hand and get the underhook. I'd like to see him, es Elijah, escape his hips off of the cage and try and grind himself out. He's going to have to shimmy his hips back and forth a couple of times to do that. I haven't noticed Beatrice nervous at all. I like he's measuring his, his gas tank as well in his first fight as a pro. You can kind of lose all your energy if you go out swinging early and i think joey's doing a good job just taking his time i agree both fighters seem very calm one thing that's worth noting is we've seen beatrice switch stances a couple times Ooh. right now he's standing in the orthodox stance where they're both their left legs are forward exchange of kicks and now we see now we see beatrice back with the right leg forward back with the left leg forward again being able to switch stances like that allows you to potentially put yourself oh and a nice punch by joy beatrice in his pro debut and he has harris down yeah, it wasn't a big, pretty strike, but that's all that it takes when you weigh 260 pounds to potentially put a guy on his butt. Oh, and now a left. Oh, Joey throwing bombs with Bo. Yeah, twice now we've seen Joey catch a kick and land a strike that has put Elijah down. If I were Elijah, I would start faking low, looking low, and kicking high. Elijah threw that big overhand right, and after he threw it, he went boom. Both guys are being very smart, calm. Not overzealous or over aggressive. Again, they're outdoors. The temperature has dropped a lot, so I don't think that's going to be a factor, but heavy breathing, and we're still not even halfway in this round one. I'd like to see a little bit more body kicking out of Elijah. You can see under the left arm of Beatrice a big red mark from where that first kick landed. I'd like to see him utilize more of those body kicks. Ooh, good leg kick by Harris, but Joey's causing damage with that left. And the right. Yeah, Joey's doing a good job of landing a single counter strike when Elijah comes in. I'd like to see him start following up that first attack with several more. I like the jabs that Beatrice is using. I also like the front kicks by Elijah Harris to keep that space. Then we see a little bit of balls, but he catches it. And now Joey with a takedown. Now he's got the back. A big Joey again, hooking and connecting. So that's one of the things about being a heavyweight and throwing a kick is it's very easy to see coming. We call that telegraphing. And that's why several times now we've seen Beatrice able to capitalize on a kick that wasn't hidden behind some hands. And you see Harris has a little bit of that cauliflower on his ear, so he's good on the ground. He's good at wrestling. Maybe we need to see that from Elijah because standing up, Joey's got him beat so far. I agree 100% with you. By mixing it up, it makes it much harder to predict offense and then counter set offense. We just saw him kind of go for a small takedown attempt there, but not a whole lot of investment in that takedown. <laughs> oh, inside trip, almost. Also, I don't know if you caught that, but Joey went with the knee. It was kind of a low knee, and then he tapped him on the back saying, hey, I'm sorry for that. And that's the sportsmanship I love. Babe. Oh, beautiful elbow by Beatrice on the inside. Like I was saying, there was no touch gloves earlier, but that's the kind of sportsmanship you typically see inside of the cage between two, two warriors. Elijah's got to get off the cage. He cannot spend a lot of the round time with his back on the cage. Although he's not taking damage, he's not in a winning position. More than 500 pounds up against that cage. Under a minute to go. So far, I have Joey Beatrice winning this round. I agree with you. I'd like to see... But there's not a whole lot of time left here. We see the hands now of Elijah Harris grip. I want to see him go for that inside trip again. He came relatively close to putting Beatrice on his back with there against the cage. Elijah needs to start letting his hands go and then follow that up with kicks. One good kick right there by Joey. Big man showing he's got kicks as well. Some snap on that kick as well, particularly for a heavyweight. 
Yeah, he has Nap on his on his right jab as well. Good first round. His first ever round as a pro. Joy Beatrice put in some good work. Now Harris, the veteran, trying to steal the round with a flurry in the last couple seconds. And Joy giving him a little bit of credit. I liked what Joey did. To me, he won round one. How did you see it? Blake, bulletproof troop. I believe that Joey Beatrice won round one, but Elijah Harris tried to steal it from him there in the closing seconds of round number one. Now, this one might come down to who's got more gas in the tank as we look at the highlights. A nice flying knee from Harris. And Eli uh, Beatrice did a good job of putting Harris against the cage. And here's one of the knockdowns we saw. Catches the, uh, the naked kick the, uh, that wasn't set up and gets a knockdown on it. Ends up doing a little bit of damage before separating. This is the very end exchange that we saw where Harris kind of let his hands go. And Beatrice kind of smiled at him like, yeah, not quite enough, my man. I'd like to see more barrages of attacks out of both fighters. Guys seem to be picking their single shots. I want to see them start putting those together into one, two, three, four, five strike combinations, whether it's hands, elbows, knees, or so forth. But following up initial attacks or following up counter attacks to try and hurt their opponent. I think Harris might want to clinch him up and try to take this to the ground. I think if they keep standing apart, Joey just looks quicker has better boxing right now, which we weren't expecting, considering it's his pro debut. But I really liked what I saw Joey in the boxing game early. Let's see if Harris changes it up. Round two underway. Harris out of the red corner. Beatrice in the blue. So we just saw Beatrice go from orthodox to southpaw again. And I believe that he's a right-handed fighter. We saw him switch again. I believe he's a right-handed fighter. I'd like to see him keep that right hand forward and start pumping that jab out. He had fantastic success with it in the first round. He's kind of started to establish it. There's the right hook again, which is connecting. Harris attempted a nice combination early. Oh! And he another right. Again, boxing-wise, Joey better the two, but Harris now responding. And that one kind of connected. It did. And so those are the moments that I talk about. You guys needing to follow up some of these attacks. We saw a right hand from Beatrice create a sweat explosion. Oh, and a right hand back from Elijah Harris. He needs to follow those up, though. Yeah, but the jab is finding its way. The arms are dropping on Beatrice. Harris now getting a little bit more confidence. Yeah, Harris had a fantastic kick in the opening seconds of round one. I'd like to see him use his hands, throw, even if he just puts his hands in Beatrice's face and then follows that up with a very uh, with a low kick with some serious power behind it. Ooh, Whoa. nice kick by Joey. He's got speed when you don't expect it. Now Harris doing what I thought he would try to do, look to take this to the ground. But this is a tough spot to get the takedown. I want to see Elijah Harris try and escrip his hands under the butt. You can see him trying to reach his fingers down there. If he can get those, he can try and jerk his opponent back. If he can get under his hips just like this, slide his hands down a little lower, almost like a ratchet. If he can get himself under the butt cheeks of Beatrice, he can pull his bottom out from underneath him and put Beatrice on his side or potentially his back. But it's a 270 pounds of Beatrice. He's got to try to lift and move. You know, it sounds a lot easier than it actually is, especially when you got a big man like that up on top. I can't tell if his hands are still clasped below the back of Beatrice, but he can't stay here. It is clasped. He needs to continue to oh, fight this takedown. He needs to jerk this back. Beatrice is doing the right thing by posting up on that right hand. Yeah, but Harris definitely hurt us during the break because he knew this fight had to go to the ground. And now there's blood coming out of the nose of Joey Beatrice. I don't know if that was a head clash. I did not see a punch. Yeah, it's hard to tell up. where that started, but you definitely see a lot more blood after that takedown attempt by Elijah Harris. Nice. Harris needs to free his left hand and Ooh. reach through. Ooh, guillotine attempt here by yeah. Beatrice, it looks like. And now Joey can put tons of pressure on the neck of Elijah, even if he can't choke him out he's wearing him down this is a bad spot for elijah harris it is and you're starting to have the guy rest his weight on the back of your head which can be exhausting when you've got another eight minutes and we're just past the halfway point of this fight if it goes all the way elijah harris now reaching down for that left leg trying to pull the ankle out but it's too much weight Ooh, good defending by joy beatrice and then he landed a kick to the body now harris responding and another right that gets in by joey harris keeps it on connecting now a nice combination Harris letting it all fly we still have two minutes in round two that was a great job of Harris by trying to follow up and throwing a handful of attacks as I mentioned at the beginning of the round some an adjustment I would like to see him make he utilized that to put Beatrice against the cage again and now he's fighting for a single leg takedown 
Now this is when you're questioning the judges. Are they giving more points for the takedown or more points for the boxing? More points for the being aggressive. Elijah Harris has been more aggressive. Has Joey Beatrice received damage? No, but then you see blood in his face. Super difficult round to judge right here. I agree. We've seen a little bit more control time out of Elijah Harris. So I, thus far in the round, I would give it to Elijah Harris, but you can see Elijah looks like he's slowing down. I'm not sure how much is left in the tank. And Beatrice looks ready to continue this fight. Oh, oh. No, right connected. Oh, and Harris stumbling. Oh, but now Harris responds. Oh, wow, Another right goes back down. Oh, the referee has to stop it. And Joey, and Joey, and Joey Beatriz wins his pro debut in impressive fashion. Enjoy yourself, big man. That right hand was paying dividends throughout the fight, whether it was his front hand that he was jabbing with it or the rear hand in the cross. And finally, late in round two, he lands that right hand, puts Elijah Harris down, and finishes with some ground and pound before referee Frank Trigg steps in. What a victory for Beatriz. Just enjoy the emotion of victory. Yeah, how much emotion we're seeing out of this guy. What a big moment. Came in pro debut on a massive stage like Lights Out Extreme Fighting, and he earned this moment right now. And you can see how much it means to him if you look right. at his face. I wanted to stay quiet just so you could enjoy it in his face. A face tells you the story. You, he's holding back tears. He is a very happy man. They threw him out to a lion there. This was not an easy fight for your pro debut, Blake. And he came on there and he put, he put on a show. He defended. He had to deal with that takedown. What a fight, what heart. I enjoyed it. Let's go to our cage announcer, Tyson Johnson, with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause for both of these gladiators. And now, ladies and gentlemen, after four minutes, eight seconds into round number two, your winner, by play of TKO, Joey Beatrice. Joey Beatrice. He was better in the stand-up game. When it went to clinching, he defended well. And when he had the opportunity, Blake, you said it. Oh, I see Joey. He, he's not getting tired. Harris looks tired. I see Joey getting stronger. Boom. Fight ended 20 seconds later. Let's go to Bonnie Joe Laughlin with the interview with our very happy and very emotional Joey Beatrice. Joey Beatrice, pro debut. How are you feeling right now? Tell us your emotion. I am... Um... This is like the most emotional I've ever been after a fight. This, this camp is hard and I had to go through a lot and I just, I wanted to come out here and showcase my skills and I did. You said you had to go through a lot. What was that that you had to go through? Oh, uh, so much stuff, personal and family and I just, it was, it was a hard time, but I just, I pushed every day because I wanted to make it right here. <sighs> I saw your confidence when you came in. How were you able to keep so poised in your pro debut? I don't know. I just, I always kind of fight like that. It, to my detriment almost. I, I want to get going faster, but I'm just too calm. Once I get punched, I'm ready to go. Speaking of being calm, you were very patient in the first and second round. How were you able to do that even after being cut? That was, I mean, that was the plan. Um, not to show all my tools right away. To, sorry. Um, to, you know, just pick him apart little by little, and he started bringing it to me, and I had no choice but to just fire, so. You told me in the weigh-ins yesterday that you were just happy to be on this stage. What can you say to Sean Merriman and being able to have you here at, the, at Lights, Lights Out? Sean Merriman, thank you so much. I would love to buy you a beer. I don't know where you are, but I would love to have a drink with you, brother. Absolute legend. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And what can you say about the underdog? Because you were the underdog in this fight. I don't ever want to be looked at as not the underdog. I love it. I love when people count me out. I love when they're like, this guy has seven pro fights. You're going to fight him? Yeah, fuck yeah, I'm going to fight him. What is next for you? What is next for you? Well... Unfortunately, my girlfriend's gonna get mad, but uh, 
I have a broken hand, so this is the second time I've broken it in a fight, so it's gonna be a little while before you see me again, but I would love to be in this very cage. Congratulations, we're all impressed here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you guys. Thank you, Bonnie. Loved what I heard until he said he broke his hand. Ouch, but that's, that's how the sport goes. Joey went in there, he won the fight, but he broke his hand. We just heard that. Blake Bulletproof Troop, I love this boxing. I like this jabs. Let's look at the highlights so you can break it all down for us. So here early on, we saw Harris come out with a great kick, flying knee, and a good amount of offense. But we saw Beatrice stay calm, like he said, start finding those kicks, catching them, and firing back with some heavy hands on Elijah Harris. Now Harris, to his credit, he tried to change up his game. He went for the takedown. He tried to box as well, but then Joey was just a step quicker. And I loved here, he was putting so much pressure in those elbows. I thought the gas tank right there was gone for Harris after that. You know, he did everything he could to put that big man on his back, but Beatriz was able to fight himself back to his feet. And then a right hand, right around this point in time, ends up dropped. Ooh. There it is, right on the face. And that shows how tough Harris is, because that's a big boy hitting hard to put him down like that. Follows up with some great ground and pound to get the TKO finish. Perfect decision also by the referee. You had to stop the fight there. If they're flyweights, maybe you don't. But at heavyweights, they had to stop the fight. Joey Beatrice applauding you. His pro debut, Blake. And he put on a good show. And you want to win. But you definitely want to win with a knockout. What a good finish for him. It was. Pressure does two things. It cracks pipes and it makes diamonds. He came out here tonight, performed on the biggest stage of his career, and created magic inside the Lights Out Extreme Fighting Cage. What you saw from Joey Beatrice? a great personality and this lights out company puts fighters that are not only are great fighters they're great quality people and awesome personalities i'm gonna give you a little tease of the fight that's coming up later today on lights out extreme fighting 10 check out these fighters my name is miguel overload painter and i train at a game bread training center yeah my name is rich salazar i fight out of san diego city boxing in downtown san diego it's actually my pro debut first fight I actually competed against him before at a tournament called the Baddest Blue, so we already grappled against each other, so I already felt them. I know he's uh, a wrestler. He's a good wrestler. Different game. Um, I respect him. I just don't see how he can beat me standing, wrestling, on the ground. I just think I'm better than him at everything, but he's a good fighter, and he's going to bring out the best in me. They can expect fireworks. They can expect the show. They can expect just a beautiful display of technique. I predict it's going to be the fight of the night, and I think the people are going to vote me as fighter of the night, and I think that I'm going to finish him. Plainbird, Salazar taking on Plainbird. That's next on Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. And don't let Salazar's soft little voice fool you. He is a straight fighter. Salazar versus Plainbird is next. This is Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Woo! You're watching Fubo Sports Lights Out Extreme Fighting.
We continue on Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Let's go to our cage announcer, Tyson Johnson, for the next fight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rich Salazar. Entering first, Rich Salazar. You heard him in that package, and he sounds like 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 a choir boy, a nice little nice little kid but then you see the physique you see his rage in the cage but of course you see that smile because he's a he's a happy happy guy but boy what a fighter is Salazar yeah he is very well rounded like he said he thinks he can beat his opponent in the striking in the grappling in the wrestling very confident in his abilities to get in here and beat his opponent and has a massive smile on his face as he makes his way to the cage to do just that this also his pro debut so i love the confidence imagine saying i don't see any way he can beat me in your pro debut but you have to have that confidence blake if not you already lost i agree well, i agree you have got to be confident getting in there and it makes me wonder is his confidence built upon his training he comes out of city boxing which is a great gym here in southern california so i believe that confidence is based off of coming out of a great team and being prepared to get in here and get it done Two amateur fights for him, but I believe he had a couple of learning lessons, and I'll tell you why. His first fight, he lost by decision, and it was an extremely close fight. If you ask him, he thinks he won that fight. So his second fight, guess what? Round three, final 30 seconds. It's about to go to another decision, and he finished the fight KO. And I think it was like, nope, I don't want another decision, another questionable decision. I love that. Now it's a pro fight. Totally different here, but I think you learn from those losses and decisions. Let's go back with Tyson Johnson. And now, please welcome to the cage, Miguel Pimbert. All right. Be a psychiatrist for me. Blake, a psychologist. How do you see his energy, his vibe? So I chatted with him briefly at weigh-ins yesterday, and he seemed confident and ready to get in and get to the action. As you can see, coming out with a poncho on it that says Mexico, and I personally am a big fan of guys that try and boost the entertainment value of their brand. Fighting out of game bread fighting with Herman Torado, who has been in the fight game for a very long time. So also coming out of a great camp here in Southern California. He looks ready, he looks angry, and he looks like he is ready to get in and get down. Mexico on his chest. Viva Mexico! A big hug and abrazo para todos los hermosos mexicanos viéndonos. Big hug to all the Mexicans watching us. And in Spanish, you can hear Echo en Mexico, Efrain Escudero. He's the color commentator for our Spanish broadcast of Lights Out Extreme Fighting. He's from Mexico. Miguel Pimber walking in with that Mexican flag. And you, what you love about all Mexican fighters, doesn't matter if it's boxing, if it's MMA, if it's ping pong, if it's checkers. If they're from Mexico and they have that pride, they're going to fight till the last second, no doubt about it. That Mexican fighting spirit, you see it in every form of competition like you mentioned. And there's no doubt in my mind that Miguel Pimbert is bringing that Mexican fighting style inside the Lights Out Extreme Fighting Cage with himself tonight. Painbert taking on Rich Salazar. This at 135 pounds. We've had fights in heavyweights. We have a light heavyweight coming up, and this a bantamweight fight. 30 years old for Rich Salazar, 31 for Painbert. Pro debut for Salazar. Again, 30 years old making your pro debut. Not normal at these ages, but Rich Salazar, you can't tell. He looks like if he's 20 years old. Look at the energy. Rich, you ready, Rich? Oh, he says he's ready. Let's go to our ring announcer, Tyson Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout will be three five-minute rounds in the Bantamweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This fighter stands five feet, five inches tall. He weighed in at 135 pounds. He represents City Boxing, hailing and making his pro debut out of San Diego, California. Please welcome Rich Salazar. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner stands five feet, nine inches tall. He weighed in at 133 pounds. He represents Game Bread MMA, making his pro fight debut. Ladies and gentlemen from Sinaloa, Mexico, please welcome Miguel Pimber. Your referee for this bantamweight bout is Herb Dean. Herb Dean inside the cage. That should tell you all you need to know about Lights Out Extreme Fighting. We bring the best 
even as referees and Herb Dean, one of the greatest of all time. I'm ready for this fight, bantamweight fight between Rich Salazar and Miguel Pittenberg. Chance of let's go Herb Dean from the crowd. Underway, Salazar in the blue corner, touching gloves with Miguel Pimbert. Out of the red corner. That's quick little jabs by Pimbert and an uppercut oh. that connects. Great job timing that uppercut for as soon as Salazar stepped in and both were exchanging jabs a little bit, keeping their hands out in each other's face. Pimbert expected Salazar to step in and caught him with an uppercut. Immediately we see Salazar now dropping to get the single leg takedown on the cage. Maybe Pieber was prepared to try and use that uppercut to prevent takedown attempts by Salazar. Now Salazar, to his credit, he didn't even flinch from that uppercut. And he up, 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 and oh, good defending by Pienberg, getting his leg down there, but it still counts as a takedown by Rich Salazar. Yeah, Salazar was able to get under and get that high crotch, but Pienberg definitely saved himself from a very rough landing there. Although he did land on his back, and now Salazar is on top, working some ground and pound. Couple strikes that connect for Salazar. Pienberg got that hook in, but after that, it's been all Salazar. Salazar's doing a good thing by staying on his feet. When he's this vertical, he needs to watch these up kicks, though. When he's this vertical, whoa, those oh, are the up kicks up -kick. I was talking about. And good heel. Those hurt also. That one landed on the hip. Salazar trying to go to side mount. Yeah, he was patient there to try and find his opening to jump through. Almost got to half or side control. You can see his foot might make it through. Pieber fighting now to try and get up to turtle position. Salazar, he's the shorter of the two, but you can see he's got a good base, a nice long upper body for a wrestler. Kind of being shorter sometimes helps. I think that's the case here. Yeah, we're seeing Pimbert try and go for some type of arm lock on the right arm of Salazar. Doesn't look like he's going to be able to get much from there. I'd like to actually see him do a sit-out on that side. Oh, Pimbert now with a takedown attempt of his own. Again, I'd like to see him sit out. Oh, he almost went for it. He needs to put more energy and intensity. There we go. Hits it again. Let's see if he's able to escape his head. Twice now he's gone for that sit-out and didn't quite get it on either side, but he's back to his feet. He's able to get up and a couple of knees. Salazar with a nice little combination. Eats another knee. That one got through. Pimber kind of bony with those knees. Could cause damage. Yeah, so Pimber had a nice tie clinch. Landed several knees, but Salazar did not. Oh, are we going to get the takedown again by Salazar? We do. Is he going to get stuck in half guard or full guard, though? It looks like it. Yeah, but I think Salazar feels comfortable any way position. I don't think he fears the jiu-jitsu of Miguel Pimbert, although he was going for an arm bar right there. And he lost it now, looking for the back of Salazar. So one thing worth mentioning is Salazar has been resting a lot of weight on Pimbert, although can't really tell. Oh. It's very exhausting. Tries to jump up. Is he going to get both hooks in here, though? His hips are a little bit low. We need to see Pimbert try and posture up. He's trying to peel that hook out. If he can get up, ooh, Salazar stays on his back. Oh, he's got plenty of time, two minutes to go. He wants to end it with a rear naked choke, trying to get those punches to open up space. He's got one arm in. Oh, no, oh, good work by Painberg. Help him out, help him out. Actually, help Rich Salazar out. What can Rich, he do to finish this? Rich Salazar needs to get both those hooks, and now they're well established. Now he needs to start fighting his hands high. You can see him trying to, peel, to slide that right hand in under for the choke. While Pimbert's reaching down, you can see his right hand reaching down. He's trying to peel one of those hooks out so that Salazar, now the hook's out. Now he's able to, if, if um, Pimbert rolls to his right again, hook is back in. This is the battle we're seeing with the right leg and the right hip of Pimbert and Salazar. And also Salazar now keeps adding points. He's won this round so far. If nothing crazy happened, so Salazar is comfortable. Just staying like this, just oh, wearing him out. Beautiful transition by Pimbert. Steps around and now attacking the double wrist lock on the right arm of Salazar. He got out from, from both hips, being, both hooks being in on his back. But Salazar is still in some Ooh. offensive position. You can see him oh. looking now for, for that e ankle. Bar. Does Pimbert got the ankle? He, so he's looking to straighten out the, the right knee of Salazar. He's lost that. He's ah. lost the knee bar now. Salazar's going to try and come up on top and get back into a turtle guard type position. Yeah, Salazar has a compact body. He's got the short little legs. Very tough to get a hold of his legs. But I love what I'm seeing. This, a master class in jiu-jitsu by both of them here. Yeah, they're rolling around, but you can see the knees just barely able to escape. He didn't quite have the knee line there. Now Salazar was able to get his knee free and now try and turn back into him. 
if Peebert's able to bring his left hip back over the top. Oh, now we see Peebert in top position for the first time this fight against Salazar. He needs to keep his head position and flatten Salazar's back on the mat and then posture up to throw strikes. Final 10 seconds of round one between Peebert and Rich Salazar. The pro debut for Salazar, eating kicks and another one, and another one, and a flying punch down, trying to finish out the round in style. I liked it, I liked it, he timed it. He saw he saw the 10 second count, and around two seconds left, he jumped up and went for it. You know, very close round, he went to do something drastic at the end of the round to make a memorable impression on the fans. Let's take a look at some of the highlights from round one. Here's this uppercut we saw at the very beginning. They're exchanging a few jabs and bunk. Bieber slides that right through before Salazar is able to put him against the cage. Salazar again dominated most up. of the round, except for this up kick, which kind of connected. If we were going to see it, boom. And an up kick like that is tremendously powerful. In my opinion, probably the single most powerful strike you could throw at a guy. Although we're both in agreement, right? Easy round for Salazar. I would give the round to Salazar. And here we go with the closeout where he just tried to jump over. Superman flying punch through the guard of Salazar. Didn't land, but style points for Miguel Pinkbert. They're closing out round one. And smart points, because if you don't connect, the round's over. So it's not like you're going to eat a couple punches and you trust that Herb Dean right. will stop it. Of course, Herb Dean does. And Herb Dean starts round two. They touch gloves. Salazar in the blue corner. Rich Salazar against Miguel Pinkbert from Sinaloa, Mexico. So we see, oh, nice. Let's see if he's able to stuff the head down here. He needs to get, Pieber needs to get his right leg back. Salazar does a good job of putting his back in his cage. If now he releases that single leg and goes under the butt cheeks on both sides of his opponent, you can see now he's around both legs. If he can S grip his hands underneath here or even let go of his left to get to the high crotch. What we know is that Salazar wants to take this fight to the ground. He said in the interview, I don't see any way he can beat me. He can't beat me in the striking game. He can't beat me on the ground. Well, I think Rich is changing his mind. He doesn't want to do the striking game against Miguel Pienberg. He just wants to make this a ground battle. You know, I think it's a smart position to be in. He just needs to be careful of those up kicks if he's able to get him back down there again. Pienberg now trying to dig in that underhook. He needs to get his butt off the cage, though, because you're never winning a match when your back's against the cage. There it is. Gets behind. I'd like to see him either separate oh. and throw some strikes here. Or drop for a takedown of his own. These are not very damaging attacks here. And I believe Salazar's been getting the better of the grappling exchanges thus far. Yeah, the knees is what's done the most damage by Miguel Pienberg. And I think he's got a chance to go towards the head with the knee also because of the height difference. And now punching. And there's the knee to the head. Oh. Thought we'd see more of those. Salazar catches his oh, leg. He's got his oh. neck here. Did he it's clinch it? It looks like he has the neck, but he does not have significant body control. He lost the neck. But he's got the back. Yeah, and if he's able to, he was landing some decent strikes there against the cage while they were still on their feet. And Salazar didn't seem to like him, but didn't do a whole lot to stop them. I'd like to see Pieper get one of his hands free and start raining down some left hands on Rich Salazar's face. Right here, that left hand should start unloading. And also, you got the elbows. They just can't go straight up and down to the spine, but they can go to the side. Well, he's got the there. If he can get control of the body... Oh, Salazar slipped out of it. Salazar is expending a ton of energy here to get out of a position. He needs to get out of that position, but it can be extremely draining. Oh, let's see a double wrist lock here by Pebert on the left arm of Salazar. With all the sweat, though, couldn't hold it that long. Halfway through round number two, halfway through the fight. And this Three rounds, five minutes each. This looks like a resting position. Oh! And Rich Salazar not only is Does that count to, as a takedown or was it just I would give a that a takedown. And not only that, but now Salazar has the back of Miguel Pienbert with both hooks in. This is a bad spot to be. One thing in Pienbert's favor, the cage is right there. And this, oh, Salazar, very smart, transitions to mount. Yeah, the difference is when you're the better wrestler, you can conserve energy even when it looks like you're losing. And that's what I think we saw. Miguel Pimber thought he had Salazar, and Salazar, I think, took it like a break. I, I don't think he expended any energy, and now he's got the back, and he has a Miguel Pimber who got tired from the positions he was in with Rich. So we saw Salazar again trying to go over the back. Oh, let's see if he's got this guillotine. He may have it. He's got the full guard. Oh, can't tell how deep he is under the neck, but it looks like he might be fairly... Legs deep. are locked. Oh, I wish I could see what the hands look like. We're on the other side of the cage. One thing worth noting, 
Uh, Miguel P. Bird is right next to his corner. You can see Herman Toronto on the right side of the cage, who is a high-level black belt coaching his fighter through how to finish this submission, which is a massive advantage when you're in a spot like this. Great comeback by Miguel Pimbert. Now he's got the position, Rich Salazar. He still has a minute 15 just to get out of this round, but again, he's not gonna be able to hold it, and Salazar now on top position. I think it was wise of Pimbert to let that go, because if you hold on for too long to a choke that's not there, you will gas your arms out. Now we see Pimbert back rolling through and trying to capture the right leg of Salazar. Beautiful jiu-jitsu transition here is by both fighters, offense Ooh. and defensively. And Rich putting that knee on the chest. Oh, it's reverse triangle, man. Final 40 seconds of round two. Nice sit, sit out. I'd like to see a little bit more intensity, but oh, he's going to pick him up and oh. get down. And now it's Miguel with a takedown. Oh, well, this fight has it all. We thought Miguel wasn't good on the ground. He's been holding his own. And now takedown as well. Yeah, and he's been uh, shooting up some fantastic submission uh, attempts throughout these transitions. Not just going for them, but trying to pull them out during transitions. And it might go for another fight here. I think this is how he got dumped earlier in the round. Oh, oh that to the head. I've been calling for the height difference, and Salazar drops the head. I'm going to give round two. I have to give it. I have to give it to Beanbird. I think to Beanbird for sure. And so I think we got 1-1 one, one going to round three. Great highlights. We saw the big guys punching. Now we see the little guys wrestling. So here, Pimer did a fantastic job getting Salazar off his back. And these were some of the strikes that he landed against the cage. And I believe we see a knee right around here that, in my opinion, did more damage than we could tell that it did. Some of the transitionings from the back here. A significantly more controlling and aggressive jujitsu out of Pimbert here in this round. Here's where I believe where he got dumped out of nowhere and Salazar comes up with top position and gets the back. <laughs> Miguel saying he's fine. I think he didn't want to get dumped, but he kind of released himself and it looked like a great takedown. It's going to get scored like a takedown, although it was him trying to get out of it. You know, yeah. it makes it difficult for the judges. So difficult, but I think in the end, Pimbert definitely did enough and we're at 1-1 one -one with Herb Dean about to and I think both fighters probably realize that they need to win this round or put their opponent away if they want to win this fight because it has been very competitive back and forth. Round three. The first two ended on the ground. How is round three going to go? It's kicks early for Peenberg. Sanders are looking for the takedown. Oh, let's see if he attacks his top arm now. If he's able to slide that left hand through. He's trying to grab his wrist from underneath his stomach. And, oh, nice little transition yeah, there, Blake. Yeah, beautiful but transition to, to stop the forward pressure of Salazar and then try and get around and go behind him. You can see the near side arm now captured between the legs of Piemert and the far side arm captured with the, with the hand, which we call this a crucifix position. If Piemert's able to pull Salazar's head under his right armpit, he opens up the head for a variety oh. of strikes. He's under the chin here. And he's he trying to grab the other arm looking for that crucifix. But he doesn't have enough control of the body to finish this choke as it is. One hand's hard to finish a choke. And not just that, but he doesn't have enough control of the body then once he does get enough of a squeeze Ooh. to finish this. Salazar trying to spin out of it. The sweat helping Salazar. That would have been round one. The fight might have been over. He's able to slip out of it. But Pimber showing, hey, I, I can take this fight to the ground too. Yeah, and again, throwing up fantastic submission transition or fan submission attempts within the transitions. And those elbows that Pimbert was just landing, he ought to just throw a few more of those. If Salazar's going to rest in this position, dropping some big elbows to the side of the head of Salazar. Again, another crucifix by, by Pimbert. You can see the left arm trapped within the legs, the right arm trapped by Pimbert's right arm. And so the left hand is free to choke. Instead of looking for the choke here, I would do some smothering where he's covering the nose and mouth of his opponent just to start taking out his gas tank. It's a very hard position oh, to escape when you get good control. And if he covers his nose and his mouth, you can almost suffocate a guy without having to jeopardize losing the position. He's got his arm pinned, the left arm by Salazar, and there he goes. This is exactly you. what I meant with the smothering of the guy. He's got three minutes left. 
and the referee's not going to stand them up from this dominant position. I would hold that and continue to smother my opponent until he did something stupid and potentially gave him the choke, which may happen right here. Yeah, and there's lots of times where, where if you're... Oh, he's got the oh, grip. Let's see if he's he got to the body enough. He's got to oh, close in. He's got to tap. He's going to tap. And yeah. Miguel Pienberg with the victory. Viva Mexico! Utilized that crucifix twice in this matchup. Came very close to getting that choke. And then second time he got it, was able to pressure his opponent with the smothering until he got the opening to finish with the rear naked choke. What a fantastic submission ring win from Miguel Pienberg here at Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Miguel Pienberg took on a, a fighter who said, I can beat him on the ground, I can beat him on the standing, I can beat him striking, I can't see him beating me. Well, he flipped the script on you because he was better than you standing, and he ended up showing he was better on the ground also. Hats off to Miguel Pienberg. Yeah, very high level submission grappling by Miguel Pienberg. Training out of Game Bread Fight Academy with Herman Torado, who is a very legitimate black belt, and not just that, a black belt in mixed martial arts, and when I say black belt, I'm talking a jiu-jitsu black belt that knows how to use grappling inside of the mixed martial arts cage because it's different. Utilized a great positional control in the crucifix to open up the submission that he ended up taking it home with. I liked what I saw, and we saw that we mentioned the Mexican spirit. I think we saw that from Miguel. In the first round, he got taken down. He's like, okay, I'm going to show you. And I think he wanted he wanted the takedown to say that I can do it too. Let's go to the, Tyson Johnson with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after two minutes, 23 seconds into round number three, your winner, by way of tap out, Miguel Pimber. Miguel Pienberg got the tap, 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 and the victory for him. What a fun night of fights. We saw the heavyweight swinging, but I love seeing some high-quality jiu-jitsu, some high-quality wrestling and striking. Now let's go with Bonnie with our winner. Miguel, congratulations. How comfortable with you going down on the ground? Because if you want to keep taking you down and grapple, how confident were you with that? Uh, very comfortable. You know, we come from very submissions. That's your lineage. We got hands. We got jujitsu. We got it all. So, you know, feel comfortable all around. Now, this is your only second fight, your first fight, Bellator. How confident were you coming into the ring? I was very confident. You know, there's always a nervous between every single fight because it's the next challenge. But I felt very comfortable. Good camp, good teammates, good, just good nutrition, good all around. What can you say about your opponent with his pro debut? Uh, congratulations. I mean, it's not the result that he wanted. He's tough. He's going to have a great career. So looking forward to seeing him out there and perform again. In your bio, you said you like whooping ass and looking good. How good do you look right now? I feel that I look amazing right now. <laughs> and what can you say, lastly, to your fans in Mexico? Oh, thank you for all the support out there. You know, muchas gracias a mi gente por todo el apoyo. Gracias a todos los que vinieron, everybody here. Thank you for Sean for setting this up. Great, great experience. Thank you to everybody there. Congratulations. You so Back to you guys. Thank you, Bonnie. What a fun fight. And Miguel Pimbert, El Mexicano, he came in with that pride, the Mexican flag, and he put on a show, and he said, we have hands, we have jiu-jitsu, we have it all, and that's what we saw, Blake. Yeah, you know, we saw a variety of different aspects of combat sports and mixed martial arts all balled together, which made for an incredible mixed martial arts fight. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. Yeah, these were high-quality jiu-jitsu. We thought Salazar wanted it on the ground, but from here, we saw a Miguel Pimbert who was comfortable on his back. Stayed very aggressive, whether he was in a defensive position on takedowns or on his back on the ground. Utilizing a variety of different strikes during grappling exchanges and closing the first round was something wild. But it's something wild that leaves the other fighter thinking, like, wait, how crazy is this guy? So I like that. It showed confidence. And then in round two, we saw him. He looked like the bigger fighter, and he used that size, that height, and it ended up working out for him. Yeah, so here he's had the legs around his um, opponent's arm looking for that crucifix. This time, Salazar was able to dump Peenbert. However, as we saw later on, that didn't work out for him. A submission attempt by Peenbert in round two, where he came very close to getting this guillotine, sitting right in the corner of Herman Torado, who was coaching him through this submission attempt, which didn't work. But here we see the rear naked choke again. Attempt once this was the finish here. Went started from a crucifix, lock got under the chin, and then went all in on this choke and was able to get the submission victory. 
What was beautiful about his attempts for finishing in the fight, he was conserving energy, and Salazar was burning, burning energy, trying to survive. And then Blake, you pointed out, he should cover his face, and instantly, boom, you saw him covering his mouth. It makes him not be able to breathe. Salazar was winded. Not having your arm for so long, it just drained that all the energy from him. And once he sunk in the lock, it was all she wrote. Yeah, that's so... He's Blake Bulletproof Troop. I am Pablo Alcina. Quick break, and we'll be back with more. You're watching Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10, and we still have a good one. Chuck Campbell taking on Jared Vendera coming up next. the biggest opportunity of my life. We're here to learn how to become a millionaire. This will be the... This is the biggest opportunity of my life. We're here to learn how to become a millionaire. This will be the toughest job interview of your entire life. I don't know what to expect. Anybody want to fight their way onto the show? As soon as I'm in that ring, gloves are on, fight's on. Putting people in uncomfortable positions is how they grow. Sean's an intense guy. He's kind of a crazy dude. Let's go! I jumped off of an 80-foot yacht. That's the best one ever. Game on. Everything you say, Kenna, will be used against you. Everybody's a competition at this point. I know what it takes to win, and it's not being nice. This just got real. Prove to me that you have what it takes. I'm thinking that it's going to be something that we could die doing. Who cares as long as does he see I have what it takes? It has nothing to do with strength. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. <sighs> it's horrible. We are back at Casino Palma. Time for our co event. Chuck Campbell taking on Jared Vendera. Let's go to our cage announcer, the one and only Tyson Johnson. Please welcome to the cage, Chuck Campbell. Co-main event, Blake Bulletproof Troop, Chuck Campbell entering first. Five wins for him. This fight at 205 pounds. He trains out of AKA. Shout out to everybody at AKA. I was there several times covering their fighters. An amazing MMA company, and that's why they've had so many UFC champions, so many quality fighters out of AKA. And here, another one in Chuck Campbell. Yeah, Chuck Campbell coming off a three-fight win streak against a very tough Jared Vandera. Here are some of my bullet points for victory for Chuck Campbell. Number one, stick and move. Get in, land some stuff, and then get back out before his opponent turns it into an exchange. Second, capitalize on counterattacks. Once he's gotten in, landed some stuff, and then disengaged, I believe Vandera is going to come charging in at him. He needs to be prepared for those moments and cause damage when it happens. And third, he needs to be patient. 
continue to get in and get back out and look for his openings. Jared Vandera came in five pounds over. So in my opinion, the longer this fight goes, the more of an advantage we see for Chuck Campbell tonight on Lights Out Extreme Fighting's co-main event. Chuck Campbell trains out of AKA Javier Mendez's AKA Javier Mendez, big hug to you. Shout out to everybody at AKA American Kickboxing Academy. Javier Mendez, one of the best trainers, MMA trainers in the entire planet. Javier, you the man. Shout out to everyone at AKA. Chuck Campbell, gotta make AKA look good, but he's not gonna have an easy fight in front of Jared Bandera. No, but he also has, worth noting, Todd Duffy, former UFC fighter, in his corner so you know not only did he have great coaching at aka but he has fantastic training partners and coaching tonight here at lights out stream fighting 10. go back to our cage announcer please welcome to the cage jared bandera they call him the mountain and i think you'll be able to tell why we're talking about six foot four of a big man seven fights inside the ufc cage his first fight here with lights out so as you mentioned earlier in the broadcast went to decision with former ufc champion andre arlovsky he is going to be a very tough puzzle to solve here are some of my bullet points for victory for jared vandera number one constant forward pressure chuck campbell's great at moving around and getting in and getting out he needs to prevent Chuck from getting out. When he's able to do that, he needs to create exchanges. He wants this to turn into a war and not a picking and choosing of battles. And lastly, utilize low kicks. We know that Chuck is going to be moving around, engaging and disengaging. So by landing big leg kicks, he's able to attack from a distance and then slow down the more athletic Chuck Campbell who will be sticking and moving. We talked about it at the top of the broadcast, you know, fighters making their pro debut, coming to Lights Out, wanting that win. Well, here we see a veteran in Jared Bandera coming to Lights Out, wanting to again win a tough 2022 for Jared. Four losses last year. So he lost all his fights. So he comes to Lights Out. Now it's 2023. He definitely wants to get a win. You know, some of those fights that he lost were short notice fights at the UFC, fighting in the biggest level against extremely tough guys on short notice without full preparation. He had a full camp for this. He's ready to get in and get to work. And one thing about mentioning with his preparation, he is now at King's MMA full time with Rafael Cordell. Oh. Another gym full of killers and in his corner night, Benice Dariul, who as you all have seen in the UFC, a top 155er. So both these guys are coming in with a stacked team and prepared for tonight's co-main event. Yeah, so AKA and Chuck Campbell and Kings MMA and Rafael Cordero and Jared Vandera, Kings MMA and AKA, that says quality for sure. Tell the tape, 39-year-old Chuck Campbell, 31-year-old Jared Vandera, 205 pounds, 210 for Vandera. He didn't make weight. Let's see his cardio for this fight, although it might not get out of the first round. Let's go to our cage announcer, Tyson Johnson. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this bout will be three five-minute rounds in the light heavyweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This fighter stands six feet, four inches tall. He weighed in at 205 pounds. He represents Team AKA. Ladies and gentlemen, with a mixed martial arts record of five wins and three defeats, he hails from San Jose, California. Please welcome Chuck Kimball. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner stands six feet, four inches tall. He weighed in at 210 pounds. He represents King's MMA with a mixed martial arts record of 13 wins and 10 defeats. He hails from Hemet, California. Please welcome Jared Vendetta. Your referee for this bout will be Herb Dean. Herb Dean back in the cage. This the co-main event. Chuck Campbell taking on Jared, the Mountain, Vandera, Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Like we saw on the teletape, Jason Vandera came in five pounds over, and it makes me wonder about his level of conditioning. Typically, we see him fighting at heavyweight. Tonight, we see him fighting just over the heavyweight limit. And the fight is underway. Campbell with the white trunks. Vandera in the red corner with the black trunks. Vandera, 
quick little fence and going forward like a robot, but he keeps going forward. And Campbell unleashing that right that doesn't connect, but didn't miss by much. One thing to notice is that um, Jared Van Der is doing a great job of cutting off the cage. He's not just coming forward, but he's cutting off the cage so that you can see Chuck Campbell's back's getting put against the cage, which will prevent him from being able to stick and move. You're telling Campbell to set it up with your hands in his corner. Van Der keeps going forward. Campbell trying to measure that right. Light, oh, leg, kick there, light leg kick there out of Jared Van Der, and he needs to continue to utilize those if he wants to slow the motion and movement out of Chuck Campbell. Great physique by Campbell. Call Van Der the mound. Well, no slouch for Campbell. Both over six, three, six, four and a half. One thing worth noting, we've seen Van Der now switch stances several times. Oof. Whoa, that head kick by Chuck Campbell, though. And then low to the leg. Oh, oh, the right hand. And again, the combination. Oh, the leg buckle. Great work by Campbell to hop back up. Nice left-right combo. And now the left jab. Ooh, snapping that jab by the 205-pound Campbell. Yeah, Chuck Campbell starting to find his range and accuracy on these straight punches early in the first round against Jared Vandera. Vandera ate those punches well, but at 205 pounds, ooh, they can cause damage. Already a little welt on the nose of Vandera. Yeah, he's... Chuck Campbell's now doing a great job of sticking and moving. As you can see, a lot more lateral motion out of him to prevent his back from getting stuck against the cage. Campbell going backwards and moving, but well. In Blake Bulletproof Troops points to victory. It was for Campbell to stick, punch, and move. And he's doing exactly what you told him so far. Yeah, the lateral motion you see here. Now he's getting closer to his back being on the cage. This is where Jared Van Inder needs to step in and create an exchange before Campbell's able to escape. Just, just like that. I'm really liking the jabs by Campbell. He's got to throw a couple more. When he does, it opens up that space for the right, but it's Vandera coming forward. Yeah, that the straight punches, particularly the jab, has been doing wonders thus far for Chuck Campbell. When he follows it with that mean right hand, that's what it wobbled Vandera with a little bit earlier in the round. Look at the cauliflower ears on Vandera. You do not want to get in a wrestling match with him. So Campbell keeping it on the feet and doing a good job boxing, moving, moving around. It's going to be a hard one to judge because, again, Vandera looks like he's being more aggressive, but he's not landing either. So I'm kind of liking Chuck Campbell so far. And another overhand right that didn't miss by much. Yeah, I think Chuck Campbell's doing the right thing, though, by being patient and trying to find the openings and utilize on the counterattacks. Another thing worth mentioning is Chuck Campbell is typically exiting to his right, which is the lead side of Vandera. That twice now he's exited to the left and eaten leg kicks at the end of the exchange. By exiting on the on the lead side of your opponent's hit, uh, body, you have a lot less uh, uh, damaging attacks to worry about. You exit on the rear side, and you have got to worry about that rear hand and rear leg. Bandera still struggling to score. None of his shots really been clean so far. Let's see if he's still measuring them out, but Campbell doing a good job moving, and there it is. That left jab is so nice. Throw it more, Campbell. Yeah, nice speed on that thing. It's fast, and it's almost every single one's connecting, but he's only throwing like five. The ring generalmanship, though, of Jared Van Der Rohe continues to cut him off. Here's where he needs to create an exchange. Oh, hard kick up top, blocked by Campbell. But those damages then low to the back of the hamstring. Solid by Van Der Starting to add up points here. So he's being, Jared Van Der is also being patient. He's starting to come in, cut off the ring. And what he's doing is he's preventing Chuck from exiting to that side. You see how he walks? Oh, oh, right comes on again. He's driving him crazy with that left jab feint, and then the overhand right. He's finding the space there. And he did that because he established such a great uh, jab with such great um, offensive moments very early in this round. So now Jared Van Der is thinking about that, which is opening up the right hand following the feint. Yeah, that's what he did. The head moved towards the right hand to avoid the jab. He never threw the jab. Instead, he threw the right. Perfect work by Campbell. So we saw Jared Van Der landing some knees to the thigh and then some foot stomps, which I think is the right offense for him to have while having Chuck Campbell against the cage because his number one objective should be slowing down the motion of Chuck Campbell. That's what's going to open up his power shots and allow him to create more exchanges. Great movement by Campbell. Just looks a little bit faster than Vandera here. Don't count out the mountain. Seven fights inside UFC. Now wanting to win in lights out. Yeah, for Jared Van Der is doing a fantastic job of close. Oh, there it is. Left and right. Uppercut by Van Der. This doesn't miss by much. We got ourselves a fight. Final 10 seconds. Who's going to win the round? And another right by Campbell. Nice.
Nice finish, flurry by Bandera. Too little, too late. I like the control of the cage, moving sideways and backwards. I love the jabs and the hardest hits. All for Campbell. How do you see it, Blake? You know, I would give it slightly to Chuck, but not by a whole lot. But we saw, well, let's look at these highlights. That was the right hand early in the first round. And then Jared Bandera closed it with the leg kick. We're seeing great movement out of Chuck Campbell this first round. But as the round went on, I felt like we started to see Jared Bandera landing more in the exchanges. But that right hand by Chuck Campbell has been there. I understand what you're saying, close. But it doesn't matter by winning a round by little or by a lot. I mean, definitely, I have to give it to Campbell. Although there are some judges that when they see a guy going constantly forward, they like that. You know, it's, it's always a tough one to do. So that's why I'm always happy to be sitting at the commentary table and not in a referee booth. Well, what's Herb Dean telling Campbell? Can you read the lips? I'm not sure. It's probably some type of warning. I don't know if he's saying his fingers down. That's my guess, the way that his hand position looked like it was going to okay, be. Okay, I'll let you know. Don't, when you have your hands open, reaching engage, out, your fingers need to be vertical towards the sky to prevent okay, eye pokes from happening. There's a rule for that. But seeing the okay. eyes of Campbell, it looked like he had no idea what he was talking right. about. Right. So I did not see it. I'm going to take Herb Dean's word for it. Let's go round two. Vendera out of the red corner with the black trunks and Chuck Campbell. Again, constant pressure out of Vandera, who's coming in and marching him down and not even necessarily throwing attacks to do it. And see how we see uh, Chuck Campbell exiting to his left. That's a dangerous place to continually exit to. It's Vandera cutting off the ring. And so what he's kind of trying to do is herd Chuck Campbell into moving towards his left, which is going to open up either a big right hand or a right kick, whether to the head or the leg. Are we going to see just striking the rest of the way, or either of these two going to take this to the ground? Um, you know, I think that striking is probably the better option for both guys thus far. I think if Chuck's able to continue to stick and move, that's what he needs to do. And I think what Van Deren needs to do is cut off the ring and land leg kicks and then create exchanges. That body shot by Vandera did connect. One of the few body shots that I've seen thrown, and then another. That overhand right is there all day, as is the left jab. And I think that's why I say Chuck Campbell needs to be patient. He needs to find those. He needs to continue to move around until those openings appear, and he needs to go for the kill when they do appear. And Derek came in five pounds over. Are you seeing that effect at all? I see their cardio bearing solid. I don't see him gassing at all. I don't either. One thing worth noting is Van Der just switched stands, and so his right leg's forward now. I believe we're going to see more right low kicks out of Chuck Campbell. One other thing about switching stands is like that. Chuck feels more comfortable as exiting to his right. Once Van Der switched, oh, that right hand again, though. Yeah, he was using the left jab to set up the right. Now he can use the right whenever he wants. But Van Der doesn't seem shocked or hurt by it. He's not fearing that overhand right, which leads me to suggest that Vendera still has confidence he can put pressure and finish this fight. I think Vendera knows he's going to have to eat a handful of those. And that's why I say create exchanges. You're going to eat that right hand, but what are you going to give him back in return for that? Because we know some of those are going to come, particularly when they're fighting at this range. If you got to cut off the ring and pressure a guy, you're going to take... Uh -oh. Oh, 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 and he's, he's... Oh, he was wobbling. I thought Campbell had him. He just couldn't unleash another second shot. And now a welt under the left eye of Vendera. And he definitely got caught with that one. Yeah, that right hand is starting to get through and create visible damage on the face of Justin Bandera. And Campbell looks fresh. He's dancing. All the confidence for him. I think he knows he's just faster. And his jab's working, and that overhand's working, and he's just twitching. He wants to finish this fight this round. I think he's being smart by being patient, though. Instead yep. of getting overzealous, he did hurt Bandera there against the cage, but I think it was wise of him to draw back, prevent himself from getting into a slug war, because these big boys, it doesn't take much to knock somebody out. Yeah, and there's another left jab, that snapping left, that's controlling this fight in my book. Campbell connected again. I've counted at least six, and then another straight right that connects. Man, Vendera's taking these punches like a champ, though. He's not He's not punching backwards. You know, there's no way you're going to go to a decision with a UFC champion like Andre Arlovsky and not be able to take a punch. Jared Vandera is as tough as they come. Campbell. Vandera needs good to, so far. Vandera needs to keep up the forward pressure. You can tell that he's starting to slow down with that forward pressure. And in my opinion, in the last minute, Chuck Campbell's been getting the better of the trading. Yeah, I, I don't... I haven't counted one strong strike to the head by Bandera. Yes, yeah, since, since this second round has begun, it's pretty much only been lighter leg kicks. 
that we've seen Van Dara land. Now we see a little more pressure out of him. He needs to capitalize what he's got. Boom. This. You can see Chuck Campbell's waiting for him to come in and land those counter striking right hands. Van Dara's now, you can see the mountain getting angry, building. Here comes Van Dara. Yeah, he needs to keep up this forward pressure. The forward, ooh. The forward pressure of Van Dara is, in my opinion, what is creating the openings for him to be able to land back. Giving him a second to catch his air. It was a low kick. Definitely. Jared Van Dara immediately recognized it and stepped back before Herb Dean even had to call timeout. Sometimes that's one of the things that happens, particularly throwing kicks, is sometimes they come a little high and you hit a guy in an unintentional spot like the groin. I think the rest might have done better for Campbell than Vendera because Vendera was building nice momentum right before that moment. I agree with you 100%, Pablo. The momentum, in my opinion, was definitely going towards him. He needs to keep this forward pressure. This is what I mean by creating his openings here. Oof. But oh. you, you can see Chuck Campbell waiting to try and unleash that right hand on him, Jared Vendera, who's moving forward. Campbell with oh. another straight right. Vendera did it in flinch again. Now a leg kick by Vendera, the mountain. And the left jab, that snapping jab, is worked again. Just touching the nose, the eye, the chin, every time he used to throw it. Oh. Final 10 seconds of round number two. Definitely seeing Vendera gassing a bit. And that's the end of round two. I have it 2-0 to Campbell just controlling the cage. Vandera did nice work. Yeah, we Pressure, saw some. But he, he, he didn't do enough for me. I, I, I'm giving it to Campbell again. I agree. And, and not by necessarily a ton, but I definitely okay, felt like some of the biggest moments of that round were, were Chuck Campbell landing some right hands. Let's take a look at some of the highlights, Pablo. And he opened up his eye. Then we see that left again. Boom, the left connects again. Just Campbell, his head movement has been solid. Left to right movement, solid. And then that right overhand has done the damage. Yeah, getting in, sticking and moving, and then really emphasizing the attacks on the counterattack. There you see, came in, stuck, disengaged. Vandera threw a little bit, and then he went back inside to throw more. But those leg kicks by, by Van Dara continuing to come in. We're not necessarily seeing the motion of Chuck Campbell slow down, though, despite eating as many leg kicks as we've seen Jared Van Dara throw. Last round, Chuck Campbell, Jared Van Dara. I think you're going to see the heart of Van Dara here. He knows he can't win it by right. decision. Round three underway. Lights out extreme fighting. The co-main event alongside Blake Bulletproof Troop. I am Pablo Alcina. Campbell with the white trunks eating another leg kick by Vendera. All Vendera has had has those leg kicks, but Campbell's still moving around nice. Yeah, so Jared Vendera, much better job in my opinion now at the beginning of the round, cutting off the ring where you know that those jabs and crosses are coming from Chuck Campbell. Vendera landed another kick to the leg and read Chuck Campbell's lips. He said, come on, baby, come on, baby, you got this. And I think he was talking to himself. He knows he has this fight, just cannot make a mistake, and he should get the win. Vendera needs to put pressure. And Campbell says, come on, let's go. Vendera drops back. So I want to see Jared Vendera start pressuring Chuck. Oh, Campbell Superman little... punch by Campbell. Yeah, that athleticism out of Campbell. And that right hand, if he's going to put Jared Vendera down, it is going to be with that explosive right hand of Chuck Campbell. Again, we see Chuck exiting to the left, exiting to the left. That's where we may see a big head kick or right hand out of Jared Van Dara to put, whoa, the right hand again by Chuck Campbell. Yeah, he's escaping to the left, but he's still landing that right. Again, Van Dara, I don't think he fears it because he's eating the punches, but time's running out, Jared. You gotta, you gotta do a little bit more. I agree with three minutes and 40 seconds left on the clock. He definitely needs to do a little bit more. Here we go. Now looking to take it to the ground. The striking game has not worked for Vendera. Maybe we'll just see him throw some more knees to the thigh and foot stomps because slowing down this lateral motion of Chuck Campbell is the way he's going to be able to set up a big power strike on the feet. He has Campbell up against the cage. High knee to the head, just not enough power. Knees to the legs, no power for Vendera. Yeah, not a ton of power, but it doesn't take a whole lot. But then again, with all the leg kicks we've seen, we have not seen a difference in Chuck Campbell's motion thus far. Those foot stomps, boy, those are painful. 
yeah, people have no idea how painful it is to have a 200-plus man stomp on your foot. Well, people know when they get up in the middle of the night and they hit the, the corner of the table, how much it hurts your little toe. Imagine if the table weighed 205 pounds and was stomping back. Right. Just to give you an idea. Final 240 of this fight. Campbell just letting the clock tick away. He knows he has a decision. Vandera trying to take it to the ground. Yeah, Vandera doing a good job of chipping away, but I don't believe that he's going to be doing enough to win this fight based upon this. I have him down two rounds to zero right now against Chuck Campbell. Campbell, he's not thrown a jab in a round and a half. Didn't throw one in round two. Dominated round one with it. And now he just moving around, just using his speed, and then the right. Yeah, he is keeping that right hand locked, cocked, and ready to rock, trying to put Jared Vandera down with it. Did see a minor little jab there. Vandera is so tough to have eaten as many of those right hands as he has eaten thus far in the fight. And left hands, too. He's got a cut over his right eye from a left jab. He's got a welt on his right eye from that right overhand. About 90 seconds left on the clock. Jared Vandera has got to get more forward pressure. When going. he does, he eats a right hand, though. That's the, that's the problem for Vandera. I'd like to see a combination by Vandera. Come in, even if you eat one, unleash an uppercut. Or at least maybe follow it up with a takedown to put him on his back. Something to follow that up because we know the right hand's coming and that Chuck Campbell's going to be exiting, figuring out a way to really capitalize on that predictable sequence of events. kick but Madera just takes so long to throw it Campbell sees it coming and he backs up and there goes the right again connected man that right hand is there's like a the left jab the speed that Chuck Campbell is able to throw that right hand with impressive and yet Madera doesn't lift his left hand he leaves it open double under oh no not double under hooks See, Vandera's got him against the cage here, but in my opinion, he needs to separate and look for a finish. Oh, double underhooks now by Chuck Campbell. Let's see if he reaches his right leg between. No, just exiting. In my opinion, a very smart move by Chuck Campbell. Campbell knows he has. Oh! Bob! Puts him down with the Baby. right! And we were waiting for it the whole fight. That overhand right was there since the beginning, and it was lights out. Yeah, Chuck Campbell very patient there and gets an incredible knockout to close out the fight with less than a minute left on the clock. What a fight. Chuck Campbell, yeah. he would have been fine stepping back. He won the fight by decision. He had the fight won, yet he said, no, I'm going to finish this show. And he went forward. And I love that about Chuck Campbell. I love that about Sean Merriman. He's bringing people here that they don't only just want to fight. They don't want to just win by decision. They want to put on a show. Sean Merriman, what a fight we saw. Oh, and he does the lights out dance. Yeah, I was very impressed by that. Stay patient, capitalized when he was counter striking, and ended up getting a beautiful highlight reel knockout, in my opinion, knockout of the night thus far. Yeah, and we saw him do the lights out dance in front of the one and only Sean Merriman, who's right here. Sean, what did you think? What did you think about this knock? I'm going to show it to you again. And here we go, the knockout by Chuck Campbell. Sean, what did you think about this knockout? I saw him earlier, and he just looked solid. His, he was focused. Uh, you know, he's walking around, didn't talk to too, too many people before. I'm not surprised at this. He's a vet. You know, PFL, Bellator, this guy's been around for a long time. You know, no offense to Jared, but it just I just saw a, a different mindset coming into this fight. Uh, I hope to get two of these guys back in the cage again at some point. Oh, I would like to see a rematch here. And Chuck Campbell coming here to lights out. We saw his, his boxing with the jabs, the power. But what I loved about it, Sean, he could have just stepped back one by decision. He had to fight one. And in the final 30 seconds, he said, no, no, no. Sean Merriman in the house. The people are in the house. Lights out in the house. I'm going to put on a show. No, he came and put on a show. And, and more importantly, man, he wanted to come and finish this fight. As you said, he was already up. But he wanted to come out and establish himself, make a point. I talked to him a little bit before the fight. He was locked in, focused, and uh, he got he has a he has some power in it. He has some power in his hands. Words of Sean Merriman, the founder of Lights Out Extreme Fighting. Let's go now to Tyson Johnson with the official decision.
Ladies and gentlemen, after four minutes, 34 seconds into round number three, your winner, by way of knockout, Chuck Campbell. Victory by Chuck Campbell, and he did the lights out dance. Let's go to Bonnie Lynn Laughlin with the winner. Chuck Campbell with the knockout, the first knockout of the night. Now that jab was really working for you. When did you know that he couldn't defend that jab? Uh, when I hit him with the first two. I knew my speed would probably be a, uh, give him some trouble. So I, my coaches told me to just stay behind the jab. Just stay behind the jab. If I have a fast jab, I just don't use it enough. Speaking of your trainers, AKA, you talked about how much, how important they were coming into this fight. Yeah, yeah. all of them there. I got Todd Duffy behind here. I train with Kane. <laughs> All the top fighters in the world over in AK, and they pushed me. They pushed me hard. So I was ready to go three rounds up in here. And Jerry, Jerry's a tough guy. I knew he would just keep coming forward. I hit him with some stuff. I even told my coaches in the second round, I said, his head is hard. Because he, cause he, I was hitting him with straight shots, but he was just walking. I'm like, man, it's Frankenstein. <laughs> Jeez. Now, the fight did come down to some endurance. I saw you keeping your breathing down. How important was that? Oh, it's very important. When I get into the cage, it's kind of easier because of the guys that I train with. I train with guys that are 40, 50 pounds heavier than me, and they just push me. They push me hard. They lay on top of me. So if I can move them and if I can go three, four rounds with them, when I get in the cage, I'm okay. You had some leg kicks that he was giving you. Was it, were you bothered by any of those leg kicks? My coaches always tell me I need to check kicks. I just eat them, though. I just, it's, not a, it's not a good habit to have because he kicked hard, but I think I was more concerned about hitting his head than checking a kick. So. On the way in yesterday, Chuck, you told me you were just happy to be on this stage. How, how happy are you right now? What are the emotions? Oh, I'm super happy right now. Like, like, this is a great promotion. Like, they hit me up. I literally fought three weeks ago, and so they hit me up like a week and a half ago. I said, of course. My weight was already low, so I didn't have to do any cut. I just went right back into training camp. And so I'd rather be in here than in training camp. This sucks. <laughs> Congratulations. Chuck Campbell with the knockout. That was Chuck. He had a great fight. And he also had Chuck Campbell had a couple great one-liners on that interview with Bonnie Jill Laughlin. He said he was like Frankenstein walking out there. I was hitting him with some stuff, and he wasn't moving. I love that. I liked his attitude. I liked the lights out dance after. Let's look at these highlights, Blake. Yeah. What do you think? He was pumping that right hand out throughout the fight. Here we go, the replay. One of those right hands earlier on in the evening. Just sticking and moving, finding his openings, and landing big counterattacks on Jared Vandera, another right hand. Yeah, uh, Bonnie asked him, he's like, when did you know your jab, your jab was working, your left jab? He said, when I threw the first two. <laughs> and we all saw it. The jab was so nice, so snapping, and then that finish. Overhand right, and it was bye-bye, baby. In Spanish, I would say, toma tu tomate. What a punch. Yeah, fantastic finish there by Chuck Campbell, waiting for his moment and then capitalizing on it when it made its appearance. Getting his hand raised here tonight in the co-main event of Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Bulletproof Troop, Pablo Alcina. See, we don't lie to the people. We promise people getting their lights turned out, and they got turned out. But coming up next, we have the main event, and these two fighters are awesome personalities and great fighters. So here's a little sneak peek of what you're going to see in Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10, the main event. My name is Anthony Doe. I'm out of San Jose, California. Uh, the American Kickboxing Academy in San Jose. Currently, as a professional, I'm in six. My name is Victor Rosas. I fought out North County MMA, and my record is 6-2-1. and one. I believe based on my, my training camp and the results through my sparring and uh, throughout this training camp that uh, it will lead to a finish. Well, if I had to predict anything, I think it would be stand-up exchange, and then I end up on top, ground and pound, call it a night. Main event, Anthony, the antidote Joe taking on Victor Rosas. That is the main event, 125 pounds of flyweight. That fight is next. Doe versus Rosas. Lights out, extreme fighting 10. The main event is next on Fubo TV.
has over 200 channels of live TV, sports, and news for half the cost of cable. To celebrate Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10, Fubo is offering a special discount for Lights Out fans. Visit FuboTV.com slash LXF. That's FuboTV.com slash LXF to start your free trial. It is time for our main event of the night, a flyweight fight, and it's going to be a great one. To kick it off, let's go to our cage announcer, Tyson Johnson. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the cage, Anthony Doe. Entering first, Anthony Doe also trains out of AKA American Kickboxing Academy out of San Jose. Once again, shout out to Javier Mendez. Their fighters are always ready. And Anthony, the antidote, Doe, you know he's going to be ready going for his ninth professional win. Anthony Doe is a killer that I have watched a lot of, and I'm really excited to see him get in here and face off against Victor Rosas. Some of my bulletproof points for victory for Anthony Doe, number one, establish dominant angles. He has fantastic movement and footwork. What he needs to do is utilize that footwork to put him in a position that is advantageous so he can land a big strike to potentially knock his opponent out. Number two, avoid wild exchanges. Move around, figure out where he wants to be, land, and then get back out. And lastly, is to mix it up. Come inside, strike a little bit, kick a little bit, move in, move out. When his opponent advances too much, go for the takedowns. The more he turns this into a mixed martial arts bout, I think the more likelihood we'll see in him walking out tonight with his hand raised. I love asking other fighters about fighters that are going to fight. So Anthony Doe, he fought in a card in Japan along with Efrain Escudero, who's our play-by uh, color commentator in Spanish. So I asked him, I go, how is Anthony Doe? He's like, man, you're gonna love him. He's he's crazy. He's crazy. He's just all over the place. He's all energy. He, he you don't know what he's gonna do. So man, I got hooked. I'm like, ooh, I want to see this. Anthony Doe. His last fight though, he lost via triangle choke, but he has fought at the one championship. He's fought everywhere. Extremely talented. Let's go now to our cage announcer for his opponent. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the cage, Victor Rosas. Rosas, Victor, oh, he's so glad to get back inside a cage. Why? His last three fights were canceled. Imagine you're training, you're getting ready, and then COVID and all those situations and everything here and there, and one fight gets canceled. A second one gets canceled. Dirk gets canceled, and he said, no, I don't want that to happen again. So he comes to Lights Out Extreme Fighting, and he's in the main event. You know, as somebody who has had a handful of fights canceled, I know that a lot of, most of the time it happens because somebody's a little scared. Victor Rosas is a scary dude with incredible hands. What he needs to do, he needs to let those hands go inside of the cage. To do that, he needs to cut off the ring. Anthony Doe has fantastic movement, so he needs to utilize his footwork to cut off the ring so that he can let his hands go. But utilizing that forward pressure and letting his hands go, he needs to be weary of the takedown. Anthony Doe has fantastic jiu-jitsu, and too much pressure by Victor Rosas may make him vulnerable for a takedown. So he needs to stay off his back and be weary of the takedown while cutting off the ring and letting his hands go. One thing I can tell you, Pablo, is this match is going to be an absolute banger. 125 pounds. These are flyweights. Have you ever tried catching a fly? Well, it's the same thing for these guys in the cage. I feel for the cameraman, because you got to work that camera left and right, and you guys at home are going to sit back and enjoy. Pump up the volume, put the needle on the record, because the main event is next. Anthony Doe taking on Victor Rosas. Oh, I can't wait for this fight. Yeah, don't blink, and these lightweights are like Energizer bunnies. They just don't stop and both of these guys want to finish here in their lights out extreme fighting debuts victor rosas his last three were canceled but before that he had three wins in a row and he won by a left hook knockout then the other one by a triangle choke and he also got a stoppage so he can beat you on the ground he can beat you with his fists 30 years old for anthony doe 34 for victor rosas 5 7 so slight longer reach for rosas both weighing in at 125 pounds let's go with tyson johnson for our main event 
Ladies and gentlemen, this Lights Out main event is three five-minute rounds in the flyweight division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner. This fighter stands five feet, five inches tall. He weighed in at 125 pounds. He represents the American Kickboxing Academy with a mixed martial arts record of eight wins and six defeats. He hails from San Jose, California. Please welcome Anthony Doe. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner stands five feet, seven inches tall. He went in at 125 pounds. He represents the North County MMA Fight School with an MMA record of six wins and two defeats. He hails from Escondido, California. Please welcome Nico Lusas. Your referee for this bout will be Jason Herzog. Jason Herzog, the referee, experience by Jason. He's called some of the greatest fights as well. He's inside the Lights Out cage. Time for our main event. Alongside Blake Bulletproof Troop, I am Pablo Alcina. Rosas Doe is next. They're locking up the cage. And the fight is underway. Doe, they call him the antidote in the black and gray pants. Rosas out of the red corner with the black and red. Anthony Doe has such a high, high paced movement. Whoa, a little slip there. But so much movement out of Anthony Doe. It is incredible watching this guy fight how much he moves around inside of the cage. Anthony Doe, they're swiping his feet, trying to knock off whatever wetness was there, but he definitely slipped. Whoa. No, straight right from Rosas that connects. Nice combination, you see the speed from Victor. Yeah, Victor Rosas, like I said, in his bullet points for victory, needs to let his hands go. And he did just that very early on in the round, and we saw some damage land on Anthony Doe. He needs to continue that in a patient manner that doesn't get him taken down, but he needs to let those hands go. And for a flyweight, Rosas doesn't move around much. He's coming straight forward towards Doe. Victor's doing a great job not overextending on his strikes either. He's staying planted and throwing good power behind him without overextending himself. Ooh, and they're also really short strikes. You see, he doesn't extend the arm at all like you're saying. They're quick and short, and the uppercut connected as well. And they're really tight to the body, protecting those body shots. Yeah, I'd like to see Doe do a better job of getting advantageous angles on his opponent. He's standing right in front of Victor Rosas, and when you're right in front of your opponent and he's right in front of you, it becomes a 50-50 gunslinger battle. I don't recommend that. I recommend stepping a little bit out so you have an angle on your opponent, but he's still right in front of you. The jab connected and kind of moved Doe. Yeah, Victor Rosas has incredible power in his hands. That's why I say he is one scary dude, and I am not... Whoa! Nice body kick by Rosas. Now going low to the leg. It's kind of like a tree. You can chop it down all over the place. Sooner or later, the whole branches start weakening. And an uppercut by Rosas. A right by Doe that connects. We told you these flyweights are quick and fast. Doe connecting. Now looking for the Muay Thai clinch and a knee that kind of got through. Yeah, back and forth exchanges. That's why we said don't blink because someone could go lights out. We saw it in the co-main event. Finished with an overhand right. Now Rosas, little blood coming from the left nostril of Doe. Rosas doing a good job of throwing combinations. We're seeing Doe kind of step in and throw a punch, while Rosas will send two, three, especially in the counterattacks, two or three punches back. Last fight was dominated by the left jab and the overhand right. This one's starting to get nominated by the same thing. The left jab and the overhand right are working for Victor Rosas. Yeah, the later punches in the exchanges particularly. Ooh. Coming out with a ooh, nice kick. Coming out with a good jab, but that hook or whatever he's following up for number two or number three, are typically the ones landing and doing the real damage. We see some blood now from the face of Anthony. Ooh, oh. And another overhand right that connects, and the breathing's going to be tough for Doe. He has blood streaming down. It's affecting his breathing. Now we see Doe almost just standing right in front of his opponent. He needs to do a better job of utilizing his angles to prevent these gunslinger exchanges. That one to the body connected. But Doe is one of those fighters, just because there's blood, that might make him more aggressive. He's not shying down at all after getting hit. 
Well, you I, need mentioned, to go for it. I mentioned Anthony Doe needs to avoid wild exchanges, and he needs to mix it up. Thus far, we've been seeing him get inside oh. some wild exchanges and only using his hands, while it's Victor Rosas who's really mixing up the hands and feet in his attacks. Great left kick to the body. Now a knee and an overhand right coming down, using all the angles with that right hand. He's throwing uppercuts there. You see an uppercut, followed by a snapping left jab. Woo. Beautiful boxing by Rosa so far. Yeah, Doe needs to stop standing directly in front of Rosas because Rosas has been doing great damage with now his hands and his feet while, they, while Doe's staying inside the pocket. Oh, another right. These are wild exchanges that I recommend Anthony Doe start avoiding. Anthony Doe might want to step back and regroup because he kept going forward and all he's doing is eating shots and kicks. Yeah, I agree. A lot more in and out motion from him. But the thing is, we see Victor almost just standing and holding his ground, conserving a ton of energy, picking his shots and then landing a few at a time. Yeah, I mean, Victor Rosas doesn't even fight like a flyweight. He fights like a middleweight. He's standing his ground. He's not moving. Short punches. Great work by Rosas. Yeah, you can definitely tell that he has been doing a bunch of Mexican-style oh. boxing, the way oh, yeah. he'll stand in the pocket, sink his feet down, and throw some heavy hands back at his opponent, particularly in combinations like we saw just there. Exactly. Nothing wild about it. The elbow's tight to the body, solid, not wasting any kind of energy at all, just brilliant boxing. Yeah, basic fundamentals go a long way. Whoa! Oh, go with two wild punches, but Rosas responds, and the opening up big cut on Anthony Doe and they're definitely gonna call the doctor don't touch him, don't touch him. yeah a lot of blood now coming out of the nose of Anthony Doe and I'm not even sure when that happened it's hard to tell because Victor Rose has been landing some fantastic hands throughout the round let's take a look at some replays from round one I think it happened Doe throws two overhand punches the left and the right and then Rosas catches them with a straight hook See if we see it again. It's coming up later on. It's a beautiful job there by Rosas to land a few strikes, step in, but not overly zealous. Ooh, that right uppercut. And these are the wild exchanges. I would like to see Doe avoid and try and be a little bit more strategic about when that happens. Wobbled him there. Yeah. See if we see it here. Doe's going to throw two punches. There's one. There's two. Boom! And there comes the, it was a right, not a left. But it was just perfect. And that's what opened them up. Yeah, especially when we see Doe throwing wild, looping punches like that. And then Victor Rosas come back with something straight down the pipe, landing flush. The shortest distance from point A to point B or from my fist to your face is a straight line. And that's what we're seeing from Rosas. Just straight jabs, straight uppercuts, straight punches. Just solid, compact, beautiful boxing. Yeah, and you can see the doctor now checking Anthony Doe. I'm not surprised that he's going to allow... Whoa! Stop. Waves the fight! That I did not expect either. Me uh, either. I did not see how deep the cut was inside, though, and if it's affecting his breathing a ton, because his nose is pretty busted also. So at that point, if the doctor asks, can you breathe from your nose and you can't, you might have to stop it. Look at the amount of blood gushing from both nostrils. You know, it might actually be potentially teeth knocked in on the bottom row because yeah. it looked like he was checking his gum line and his mouth as well. Or maybe he has a broken jaw or potentially some teeth dislodged or something else. Because you can see here, he's looking down at the mouth. Yeah. And that's, in my opinion, what he calls the fight for. He's like, open open your mouth, took a look in there, and I don't know what's going on inside of the mouth or nose of Anthony Doe, but enough that the professionals ringside decided to call the fight. Let's go to Bonnie Jill Laughlin with the interview with our winner, Victor Rosas, who put on a display, who put on a great display of boxing. Bonnie with the winner, Victor Rosas. Victor Rosas, wow. Great sportsmanship there. Great sportsmanship there. Bonnie just letting them have their moment. I love seeing this. And I, I, I agree with the stoppage. And are we going to Bonnie now? Let's go to Bonnie, Jill. Well, no, first to the official decision. In a round number one, the doctor has stepped in to stop this bout for your winner by TKO, Victor Rosa. Yeah, from this angle, the nose definitely looks broken. Victory by Victor Rosas. Now let's go to Bonnie Jill Laughlin with the very happy Victor Rosas. Victor Rosas. 
Victor, how are you feeling? Did you know that was going to be that fast pace coming out of that first round? Um, I was hoping for a first round finish. I didn't think it was going to go to the end and then stop, but I'll take that. First round is first round. Fantastic boxing. That's what I noticed. The combinations were really working for you. He was, he was eating a lot of punches. That was what you knew you had to keep praying on. You know, I was surprised that he stood there in front of me like that. That's what I wanted. I thought he was going to move around a lot more. Um, I was thinking that I was going to have to stop his movement, but he stood there in front of me, and that's what happens. Now, once you cut him, you could tell that the breathing, he was starting to, you know, the blood was starting to run down. His breathing was not working too well. That's when you knew to you have this win. I think it was one of those overhand rights that I caught him with that broke the nose. And then after that, I wasn't really sure if the doctor was going to let him continue or not. But he's a tough opponent. I know he was wanting to keep fighting. I would have done the same thing. Um, I wish him the best of luck. Were you surprised with the stoppage? Uh, no, I kind of was thinking that might happen. I wasn't sure, like I said, if they were going to let him continue or not. I know he wanted to, but, you know, it happens. Fantastic. Congratulations. Victor Rosas with the win. Thank you, Bonnie Jill Laughlin. Amazing interviews for all our fights. We're going to take a quick break, but we still have a lot more. Blake Bulletproof True, Pablo Alcina. We are back to wrap up Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. We recap the main event, Rosas versus Doe. The better boxing definitely delivered in this one. Victor Rosas, crisp jabs and an overhand right that broke a nose and turned out the lights. Yeah, fantastic hands out of Victor Rosas. I knew he needed to get in and let the hands go, and he did just that, causing a doctor stoppage between rounds one and two in our main event here at Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. Another amazing night of fighting, Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. We saw heavyweights, we saw light heavyweight, we saw the flyweight turn out the show. We saw Joey Beatrice crying from emotion, winning his pro debut. We saw Campbell doing the Sean Merriman Lights Out. We saw it all, Blake. It was an incredible night of fights here at Lights Out Extreme Fighting. And as always, somebody got their lights out. But I love seeing the emotion from... Beatrice and his pro debut winning and then seeing someone like Chuck Campbell a veteran returning to fight in lights out and saying I want to come back I want to fight in lights out extreme fighting again I love that and Victor Rosas closing out the show solid boxing arms in punching jabbing liked it found his shots an incredible night of fights here at lights out extreme fighting we saw some scrapping we saw some technical fighting and we saw a whole bunch of excitement Blake Bulletproof Troop, he's not only a pro MMA fighter, 
a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. You get the black belt yet? Not yet. Soon. But he's an NWA superstar. Blake Bulletproof Troop. I am Pablo Alcina, Efrain Escudero in the Spanish. We've been part of Lights Out for a while now. And Blake, loved working with you, baby. Hopefully we'll keep this growing. This was Lights Out Extreme Fighting 10. In the name, Blake Bulletproof Troop and Pablo Alcina. Our producer, George Amir, an amazing job. And our director, Pablo Urquiza, I want to thank everybody, especially Sean Merriman, and for all the fighters who once again put on a great show. Thank you, and thank you for all the viewers on Fubo TV. We will see you in Lights Out and Street Fighting 11. Until next time, bye, bye, baby. Welcome back, everyone, to Lights Out Extreme Fighting. Todd Kennelly along with Jonathan King, Manuka Kopian. What a first half it was, and we're just getting started. The featherweight title still on the line, as well as Chad George's final foray in the MMA cage. It is time to fight on. We take a look now at our tail of the tape for this highly anticipated matchup. Will the pass rusher who's used to getting a tackle for a loss, will he get a big victory, John? Yeah, McCain's gonna have a long reach advantage, but giving up a little bit of experience to Jamal Harris. Let's kick it up to Barry Egget for the official introductions. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner to my left, wearing the black trunks. He weighed in at 221 pounds even, fighting out of Oxnard, California. Here is Jamal McMeesey Harris. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner to my right, wearing the black trunks with the red trim. He weighed in at 221 and one half pounds. This former NFL player is making his MMA debut tonight from Greensboro, North Carolina. Here is the animal, Chris 